and Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Government has always cherished our close relationship with the United States. It was the combined effort of the UK, the Irish Government and the US Governments that brought the troubles to an end. And it will take a renewed and ongoing partnership to safeguard Northern Ireland's stability and prosperity in the future. That's why I announced earlier this month the appointment of Trevor Ringland MBE as the first Special Envoy to the United States on Northern Ireland. The Special Envoy will support our Government's important mission to promote Northern Ireland as an excellent place to live, to work and to do business. Thank you. I, I do welcome um, the news that my right hon. Friend has appointed the Special Envoy. Does he agree with me that it is so important to engage not just with the US but all of our international friends and partners um, to ensure a greater understanding of the challenges that Northern Ireland faces but also the opportunities that this integral part of the UK has? Secretary Lewis. My honourable friend makes a, a, a spot on point. She's absolutely right. And we in the UK are committed to working internationally to tackle global challenges, as was demonstrated by our hosting of the G7 just last weekend. As an integral part of the Uni Union of the United Kingdom, we will always fully represent the issues that matter most to Northern Ireland when we engage with our international partners. That's the spirit in which we and, and I appointed the Special Envoy to the United States. I look forward to working with Trevor England on that. And she is also absolutely right. Northern Ireland is a phenomenally exciting place to live, to work, and so much opportunity in cyber, advanced engineering technology, I could go on. It has a lot to offer the world, and we will continue to promote that around the world. Shadow Minister Alex Davies Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I associate my, my thoughts with your comments earlier today, and my thoughts are with all of Joe's friends, family, and former colleagues. Mr. Speaker, inflaming tensions, undermining trust, a formal diplomatic rebuke. We would expect this language and action to form the backdrop to a summit with our adversaries rather than our closest allies. Is the Secretary of State not alarmed that our government is increasingly isolated from partners on the protocol? And what comfort can the Secretary of State, who boasted about breaching international law, provide to the new US administration that his word can be trusted? Minister. Uh, well, I obviously don't recognise quite the context the Honourable Lady outlines, but I would just say to her that, as I said earlier on, what colleagues can see and people around the world can see is that I will always be straight and give a direct and honest answer to a question, as I did um, last year. And I have to say, working with our partners, as I do regularly in the United States, they are very clear, I think, in understanding of our determination to make sure we deliver on that. Um, what is actually, to an extent, a joint endeavour between the UK and Irish Government and actually with the support of the United States, which is a delivery and protection of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. And we make no apologies whatsoever of putting the people of the United Kingdom and the people of the Northern Ireland first in everything we do around Northern Ireland. Let's go to Gavin Robinson. Gavin. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And can I congratulate the Secretary of State and wish well uh, Trevor Ringland on his appointment as a Special Envoy from Northern Ireland. The Secretary of State will know that Northern Ireland has attracted significant interest internationally over the last number of decades. At pivotal moments, it has been incredibly helpful, but at other times, uh, their involvement can be naive and, worse still, partisan. And in that vein, can I ask the Secretary of State what reflections he has to make on the deeply unhelpful and destabilizing contribution from the Irish Tonnesty yesterday at such a grave time? Of political instability in Northern Ireland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I join the other two gentlemen, I think, in uh, some surprise at the comments we saw yesterday. I, I, I have to say, we would be concerned about any deviation from the principle of consent as enshrined in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Though that agreement, of course, also does uh, respect the right of anyone to express their views, and we fully support that. We do note the uh, recent Life and Time survey, which had support for United Ireland at a low of 30% uh, in Northern Ireland. And I also um, am, am aware of the polls that put Sinn Féin ahead in the Republic, which may explain the timing of some of these comments from the Tornesty. I would urge everyone to dial down any rhetoric, particularly at this time of year. I think it's unhelpful and ill-advised. Whatever the circumstances, this government will support the principle of consent and all of our obligations under the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Substantive question to the Secretary of State. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And with permission, I will answer questions 12 and 13 together. There have been extensive technical discussions with the European Commission, both as part of the formal withdrawal agreement structures and in support of them. I have joined Lord Frost in his comments and his engagements with Vice President Sefcovic and Northern Ireland businesses and civil society, as I said, as well as meetings with the Irish Minister for Foreign Affairs, Simon Coveney. These discussions have covered a wide range of issues related to the operation of the protocol. 
there is an urgent need for this ongoing dialogue to make real progress soon and to do it as soon as possible so that we avoid any disruption to critical supplies such as food and medicines. Let's go to Jerome Mayhew. I wasn't lucky enough to be in this place with Jay Cox, but it's quite clear that she made an enormous impact uh, during her time here and is much missed. Mr Speaker, I know that both negotiating teams worked hard, but it was really disappointing to see the lack of a significant breakthrough last week. We need pragmatic, sensible arrangements in place, just as we need devolved government work here again with a new first minister. So does my right honourable friend agree with me that the European Union needs to engage with the practical proposals that are being put forward on issues like veterinary agreements and authorised trader schemes if we're to make progress on the ground? State. Yes, my honourable friend is absolutely right. I know he has a, a huge uh, history and knowledge and understanding of uh, the nuances and uh, the issues in Northern Ireland, and it is absolutely right. We need to see a pr pr pragmatic, flexible approach. The EU have talked about that. Uh, the Vice President himself on British media outlined that point. We need to see that in practice um, as we move forward. As I say, we have put forward a whole series of proposals, and we look forward to hearing from the EU European Commission engaging those in a, in a real and direct way. Jack Brereton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Following some of the comments last week, particularly from President Macron, will my right honourable friend do everything in his power to make very clear to those in the EU that want to divide up our country that Northern Ireland is an integral part of the UK? Yeah. 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 My, my honourable friend makes a, a correct and an important point. We've been crystal clear on this, and I will be again today. Northern Ireland is a full and an integral part of the United Kingdom. Authority there is exercised within Northern Ireland by the UK, not the EU. We believe that being part of the UK is the best thing in the interests of all in Northern Ireland, but we also believe, and I think it is fundamental, that Northern Ireland contributes to make a stronger and more prosperous United Kingdom. Can I lock up? Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. Given that certain provisions of European Union law apply to the United Kingdom in respect to Northern Ireland by virtue of the EU Withdrawal Act, can the Secretary of State explain the legal effect of unilateral extension of grace periods, and would he not agree that the time has come to do the right thing by the people of Northern Ireland and make use of the diversion of trade provisions of Article 16 that allow for legally effective action against arrangements which are damaging the United Kingdom's internal market, businesses in Great Britain, and consumers in Northern Ireland. Secretary of State, the time for action is now, not when the Belfast Agreement is in complete tatters. Yeah. So State. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We are working hard and in good faith to find solutions. Our overriding focus, as I have said, is on stability and safeguarding the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and restoring cross-community confidence and in the practical operation of the protocol. We do believe the protocol could work with common sense and good faith and flexibility from the EU, and we're working to resolve issues urgently, acutely aware of the time constraints that we face, as she rightly outlined. We are continuing to talk, and I hope we can make better progress through the joint committee structures designed for resolving these problems. If we can't do that, as I have said before, as the Prime Minister has said, no options are off the table. We now come to Kevin Brown. Kevin Brown. Sorry, Mr. Speaker. Number 16. Number 16. <laughs> You're always here to help, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Um, we have taken extensive steps to implement the protocol, including providing £500 million for a range of support schemes, such as the Trader Support Service and Movement Assistance Scheme. The Trader Support Service alone has created 1.8 million declarations, supporting nearly 700,000 consignments since January. Despite these huge efforts, though, the protocol is presenting significant challenges for Northern Ireland, and we are seeing sustained disruption to trade, which is causing real impacts on livelihoods and disruption for citizens. So unless pragmatic risk-based solutions can be found rapidly to a range of issues, cross-community confidence in the protocol will be eroded, and we will therefore be continuing to work actively with the EU to find urgent solutions. Kevin Brown. Apologies, I've only been here 20 years, Mr Speaker. Yeah. <laughs> um, but isn't it true that the Prime Minister signed up for something in the protocol that he had no intention of honouring, yeah. just in the way yeah, 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 yeah. and the practice he's followed throughout his life and yeah. got away with it? 
But the truth is, not, he's not going away with it now. Right, Isn't that the reality? Yeah. I would suggest that the Honourable Gentleman has a very good read of the protocol. The protocol we sign up to is very clear that it will not disrupt the everyday lives of people in their communities, that it will respect the integral market of the United Kingdom and the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. Arguably, at least two, and some would argue all three of those things are currently in breach. We have a duty to deliver for the people of Northern Ireland. We will do that. Final question, Liam Pesley. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Isn't it a fact, Secretary of State, that the protocol has partitioned the United Kingdom? It has undermined business. It has damaged the political and social fabric of Northern Ireland. And our EU partners, in whom single market we share, don't even know that Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom. Uh, there are more checks now happening between GB and Northern Ireland than between Belarus and the EU, between Russia and the EU. And this morning, Lord Frost has told us that there is no risk whatsoever for any of these goods entering the single market. Give us a timeline, Secretary of State. When will this be fixed? Secretary of State. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman makes some very important and, and correct points. The protocol was always about dealing with goods that are at risk or are moving into the European Union. It is farcical to have a situation with products that are never moving into the European Union, indeed with businesses, well-known supermarkets who don't even have stores in the Republic of Ireland, are having to go through the same sort of checks. We want to make sure that is resolved. We absolutely understand that the EU's core focus, as they have said, is on protecting their single market. For us, the core focus must be about respecting the single market, but our focus is on protecting the Good Friday Belfast Agreement in all of its strands and making sure the residents and citizens of Northern Ireland can have access to the products that they should have as part of the, an integral part, an important part of the United Kingdom. Before we come to Prime Minister's questions, I would like to point out that the British Sign Language Interpretation of Proceedings is available to watch on ParliamentLive.tv. So we now start with Sir Robert Neil. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I know that the Prime Minister will report later in what has been away a long time. Question one. Try again, Mr. Speaker. It's only 15 years in my case. <laughs> Need another 18. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today marks five days since the murder of our friend and colleague Joe Cox. My thoughts, and I'm sure those of the whole House, are with her family and friends. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure that the House will wish to join me in offering our thanks and best wishes to Sir Roy Stone, who is leaving the Government Chief Whip's office and the Civil Service. He's worked for 13 Chief Whips and for over 20 years has played an invaluable role in delivering the Government of the Day's legislative programme. We wish him well. Mr. Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Sir Robert Neil. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am sure we would all wish to associate ourselves with the Prime Minister's remarks in relation both to Joe Cox and uh, Roy Stone. Uh, the Prime Minister, I know, will report later to the House in more detail uh, on the G7 summit, which I know President Biden described as extremely uh, collaborative and successful. Uh, in taking forward the agenda, and in particular that part of the agenda of the summit, which calls for us to work to uphold the rule of law uh, and respect for an international rules-based system, will he bear in mind and task all parts of government to promote the great asset that we have in English common law uh, and in the expertise and reputation for integrity of our judiciary and legal systems? Will he make sure that those willing assets are harnessed in the pursuit of that G7 agenda, be it through writing commercial contracts with English law as a jurisdiction or helping through our expertise developing countries and markets? Prime Minister. I thank my, uh, my right hon. Friend for his question. He raises a very important and vital sector of our economy, our legal services industry and our judicial system, which is admired around the world. One of the reasons uh, that we're capable of attracting so much inward investment into this country, Mr Speaker, but also one of the key exports, uh, Mr. S uh, Mr Speaker, that we've been able to promote just recently, thanks, for instance, to our free trade deal with Australia. Yeah. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join with the Prime Minister's remarks in relation to Sir Roy Stone? This week also marks the fourth anniversary of the Grenfell fire tragedy, where 72 people lost their lives. It's frankly an outrage that there are still more than 200 high-rise flats with Grenfell-style cladding, and many leaseholders are trapped in homes that are neither safe nor sellable. The best way to mark this tragedy is not with words, but with action, and I urge the Prime Minister finally to end the cladding scandal. Yeah. Yeah. 
Mr Speaker, as the Prime Minister has already said, today is the fifth anniversary of the death of our dear friend and colleague Joe Cox. Joe had already changed so many lives for the better. She was passionate about creating a fairer, more just world. I know she would have gone on to achieve so much more and that she would have been so proud of the work of her foundation and what it's doing in her name. Joe and I were in the same intake into this house. We were friends and our children are around the same age. And there's not a day that goes by when we don't miss Joe. And I know I speak not just for these benches, but for many across the house when I say that today we remember Joe. Yeah. Mr Speaker, does the Prime Minister recognise that his decision to keep our borders open contributed to the spread of the Delta variant in this country? Prime Minister. Uh, uh, no, Mr Speaker. I think that uh, Captain Hindsight needs to adjust his retro, his retro spectroscope because he's completely wrong. Uh, uh, we put India we put India on the red list, Mr. Speaker, on April, on April the 23rd, uh, and the Delta variant was not uh, so identified until April uh, the 28th, uh, Mr. Speaker, and was only identified as a variant of concern on May the 7th, uh, Mr. Speaker. When he criticises this government for wanting to keep our borders open, just remember that he voted 43 times in the last five years, Mr Speaker, to ensure that our border controls were kept in the hands of Brussels, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this is absurd. I have, on seven occasions at PMQs, raised the question of the borders with the Prime Minister. They are all marked up in the transcript. They are all there in Hansard, uh, Prime Minister. Time for a better defence. Your defence is as bad as your border policy. And Mr Speaker, this is the, the Prime Minister talks about the dates. Let's go through the dates. On March the 24th, a new variant was reported in India. On the 1st of April, India was reporting that over 100,000 new infections were rising a day and rising. But the Prime Minister kept India off the red list until the 23rd of April. In that time, 20,000 people came into the UK from India. What on earth did the Prime Minister expect would be the consequences of that? The British people did their bit by following the rules and getting vaccinated, but the Prime Minister squandered it by letting a new variant into the country. That was not inevitable. It was the consequence of his indecision. If the Prime Minister disagrees with me and he answered the first question no, what is his explanation as to why Britain has such high rates of the Delta variation? What's his explanation? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, there's a very simple reason why the UK generally has a better understanding of the variants in this country, and that's because uh, we do 47% of the genomic testing anywhere in, in the world, uh, Mr Speaker. And uh, I, I really think that he should get his, his facts straight, because uh, the, the Delta variant, as I've said, was identified uh, in this country on uh, April the 28th. He, and, and I have a, a document on which I believe the uh, Leader of the Opposition is, is relying, Mr Speaker, in which he says that the Delta variant, it, it, it seems to be published by someone called David Evans, uh, of General Secretary of the Labour Party, uh, saying that the Delta variant was identified on April the 1st, Mr Speaker. He says B1617 uh, was des designated under investigation on April the 1st, uh, the Delta variant. Mr Speaker, that is not the Delta variant. That is the Kappa variant, Mr Speaker. It's a, it's a gamma, uh, Mr Speaker, for the Labour Party. There's a difference. The Delta variant, as it happens, is, is seeded around the world in 74 countries and um, sadly is growing. But there's a difference between those countries and this country, Mr Speaker. In this country, we've vaccinated almost 79% of the adult population and given two vaccinations to 56%, a, a programme that he would have stopped, Mr Speaker, by keeping us in the European Medicines Agency. Yes, the, the, the question was, what's his explanation for our high rates of the Delta variant? Answer there came none, other than apparently we understand the variant. The data is very, very clear. Our NHS, our NHS has been doing an amazing job with the vaccine rollout. But while the NHS was vaccinating, he was vacillating. It's because of his indecision that our borders stayed open. It's because of his indecision that India stayed off the red list. It's because of his indecision that in that period, 20,000 people came to this country from India. 
Mr Speaker, the consequences are now clear. The rate of the Delta variant is much higher here than in other countries. And we learn today that, tragically, once again, the UK has the highest infection rate in Europe. We did not want to top that table again. Mr Speaker, if his borders policy is so strong, how does the Prime Minister explain that? Mr Speaker, I think for, for the ease of the House, he should begin by pulping uh, his document in which he incorrectly identifies uh, what the Delta variant, uh, what the Deri Delta variant is. Uh, which, uh, and, uh, Mr Speaker, we took uh, the most drastic steps possible to put India on the uh, red list on April the 23rd before that variant was even identified. And the, the big difference between this country and the rest of Europe, he loves these uh, comparisons, uh, Mr Speaker, it shows his, his instincts, but the big difference is that we've had the fastest vaccine rollout anywhere in Europe. Uh, we have a very, very high degree of protection, and it's thanks to the vaccine rollout, thanks to the fantastic efforts of the NHS, that we have now, and we can continue, with one of the most open economies and societies in Europe and get on and get on with our cautious but irreversible roadmap to freedom, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, if the Prime Minister put as much effort into protecting our borders as he does coming up with ridiculous excuses, the country would be reopening next week. But even now, what do we know? The Delta variant is responsible for 90 per cent of infections in this country. He's persisting with a traffic light system that doesn't work and won't stop other variants coming in. Mr Speaker, after so many mistakes, and with the stakes so high, why doesn't the Prime Minister do what Labour is calling for? Drop the traffic light system, get rid of the amber list, secure the borders, and do everything possible to save the British summer? Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, he doesn't even know what the Delta variant is. Uh, and he, and, he, and, he, and uh, we, have the toughest, we have the toughest border measures anywhere in the world, and we will we will continue. Uh, we have 50 countries on the we have 50 countries on the red list, Mr. Speaker. And if he's now saying if he's now saying uh, that he wants to stop all transit, all traffic, all travel to and from this country, uh, then it's yet another flip flop uh, from the Labour leader of the opposition. Yet another yet, yet another totally unintelligible. Flip flop, Mr. Speaker. If he wants to, if he wants to close this country down uh, to travel, which is what I understood him uh, to be saying, uh, then it's not only an, a, a yet another flip flop, but it's also totally pointless because we have 75% of our medicines and 50% of our food that comes in from abroad, Mr. Speaker. He's got to, he's got to adopt a consistent position. Kirstama. Mr Speaker, what I've learned, the worse the position for the Prime Minister, the more pathetic he gets. Is he really suggesting, is he really suggesting that the 20,000 people who came in from India were bringing in vital medical supplies or food? <laughs> it's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. What we were arguing for is for India to be on the red list between the 1st and the 23rd of April. If that had happened, we wouldn't have the Delta variant here. And it's as simple as that. The Prime Minister's former senior adviser got it absolutely right. He said, and I quote, fundamentally there was no proper border policy because the Prime Minister never wanted a proper border policy. The man who was in the room. And it's those in hospitality, in clubs, in pubs, the arts, tourism and travel who are paying the price of the Prime Minister's failure. All they ask is that they ha if they have to keep their businesses closed, they get the support that they need. But where is it? Business rate relief is being withdrawn from the end of this month, affecting 750,000 businesses. Furlough is being phased out. Mr Speaker, in Wales, the Labour government has acted by extending business rate relief for a year and providing new support for those affected. When is the Prime Minister going to do the same for businesses in England? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we're proud of the support we've given to businesses up and down the country and the whole point about the cautious approach uh, that we are taking is to continue support b both with furlough and with uh, support through business rates, through uh, grants of up to £18,000, uh, the support from councils, uh, all of that is, is continuing. But what we're also seeing is uh, we're seeing businesses slowly uh, recovering and the growth in the economy in April was 2.3 per cent. Card spending over the bank holiday weekend was actually 20 per cent above uh, pre-pandemic levels, Mr Speaker. I know how tough 
things have been, and we will look after business throughout this pandemic. But thanks to the vaccine rollout, thanks to the cautious steps uh, we are taking, we are seeing a shot in the arm for business across the country, and we will look after them all the way. Keir Vicar, yes, again, it's not what the government has done, it's what's needed now in light of the decision that was taken this week. Hospitality UK says the sector will lose £3 billion because of the delay and that 200,000 jobs could be at risk. That's not what has been done, it's what's needed now, Prime Minister. And the Federation of Small Businesses warns the government is being dangerously complacent. I think we've just seen an example of that. Mr Speaker, we all want these restrictions to be over, for our economy to be open for businesses to thrive, but the Prime Minister's indecision at the borders has blown it. And the, and the, problem, with, the problem with everything the Prime Minister says today, both what he says at the dispatch box and also what he mutters, um, is that we've heard it all before so many times. Last, last month, March, he said we could turn the tide in 12 weeks, remember that? Then he said it will all be over by Christmas. Then we were told June 21st would be Freedom Day. Now we're told July 19th is Terminus Day. The British people don't expect miracles, but they do expect basic competence and honesty. And when it comes to care homes, protective equipment or borders, we see the same pattern from this Prime Minister. Too slow, too indecisive, over-promising, under-delivering. After all these failures and mistakes, why should anyone believe the Prime Minister now? Minister. Mr Speaker, why should anybody believe the Leader of the Opposition uh, when, he can't, uh, when he, can't, he can't decide what he thinks from one week to the next? He says he has a, a tough position on borders. Actually, he was attacking uh, quarantine uh, only recently and saying, and saying that it was a blunt instrument that should be lessened, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, what I think the people of this country want to see is the government getting on with the vaccine rollout and getting on uh, with our cautious and irreversible roadmap to freedom. And I'm very pleased, and he, I know, he should say it again, uh, that we have one of the fastest vaccine rollouts anywhere in the world, certainly the fastest in Europe. It would not have been possible if we'd stayed in the EMA. We would not have been able to control our borders if, uh, as he voted for 43 times, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, we'd stayed in the, in the EU. Uh, we're getting on uh, with the job. We're bringing forward now 23, 24-year-olds uh, for asking them to come forward for their vaccines. I ask everybody to come forward uh, for their second jab. I trust uh, he has had his, Mr Speaker, and we are delivering on our commitments uh, to the British people. Not only a, a, a great outcome at the G7 summit uh, this last weekend in Carbis Bay, but a new free trade agreement uh, with Australia and a building back better across our country. We're getting on uh, with the job, Mr Speaker, and it would be, be a wonderful thing uh, once in his uh, time as Leader of the Opposition to hear some support uh, for what the government is doing uh, and, 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 and some backing up uh, for our approach. Paul Brister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last year, doctors and care settings issued an unprecedented number of do not resuscitate orders to patients with learning disabilities and mental illness. Many were unlawful and caused avoidable deaths. Despite urgent CQC and NHS guidance, shockingly, this practice has continued. Last week, The Telegraph reported that Sonia Delion died unresuscitated. Her family said she was given a DNR without them knowing, and with her learning disabilities and schizophrenia stated as reasons. Does the Prime Minister share my alarm about these cases, which should have no place in our care, and does he agree that they should be independently investigated? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, th I thank my honourable friend for raising this, this very sad case with me, and I'm sure the whole House uh, will be thinking of Sonia de Leon and her family. I think that such uh, decisions on uh, do not attempt, uh, do, uh, do, uh, do not resuscitate, uh, sh uh, should be made only uh, in accordance with uh, a decision uh, involving the person concerned and their carers and their families, Mr Speaker. Let we now come to the SNP leader, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate myself with the remarks that you made, the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition and the absolutely brutal death of our friend and colleague Joe Cox five years ago, a woman that was dedicated to public service that made in her short time here a tremendous contribution to this House and our thoughts are very much with her family, her friends and all those that uh, care very deeply for her loss. And of course, as we do that, we should also reflect on 
what we saw earlier this week with the journalist Nick Watt chased through the streets yeah. of Whitehall by a mob seeking to intimidate. And we must all stand up in this House for the rights of journalists to be able to go around their work safely. May I say, uh, Mr Speaker, good wishes both to Scotland and England ahead of the football match on Friday evening. But if I, if I, if I may say so, I do hope that uh, we don't see Scotland being dragged out of the Euros uh, against our wishes <laughs> at the end of the week. <laughs> Mr Speaker, as we, as, we, as we enter the chamber, we see what is reported to be WhatsApp communication between the Prime Minister and Dominic Cummings, and perhaps the Prime Minister will clarify whether or not these are genuine and whether the derogatory comments that he expressed on his Health Secretary are valid or not. Mr Speaker, this morning... The details of the disastrous trade deal with Australia are slowly seeping out. It tells us everything that we need to know, that these details are being celebrated in Canberra, but they're busy being concealed in London. For all the spin, it's clear that this Tory government has just thrown Scottish farmers and crofters under their Brexit bus, just as they sold out our fishing community. So today, those with most to lose from this deal don't need to hear the Prime Minister's usual waffle. Their livelihoods are at stake, Prime Minister. Just this once, just this once, they deserve honest answers from this government. Can the Prime Minister confirm that from day one of this deal, 35,000 tonnes of Australian beef and 25,000 tonnes of Australian lamb will be free to flood the UK market tariff-free? Minister. Mr Speaker, this is a great deal for uh, the UK, it's a great deal for Scotland, uh, it's a great deal for Scottish whisky, it's a great deal for Scottish uh, business and, and services export, it's a great deal for Scottish legal services, but it's also a great deal for Scottish farming. And how tragic, how absolutely tragic that it should be the posture of the, uh, of the Scottish National Party, Mr Speaker, uh, to see absolutely no way in which uh, Scottish farmers uh, could be uh, able to take advantage of the opportunity to export around the world. What well, he doesn't realise is there already are £350 million worth of UK food going from uh, this country uh, to Australia. This is an opportunity to turbocharge uh, those exports, to get behind uh, Scottish farming and encourage them, Mr Speaker, not run them down. Ian Blackford. My goodness, I don't even think the Prime Minister can believe that tripe. Mr Speaker, in the Tories' desperation to get a post-Brexit trade deal with somebody, with anybody, they've given the farm away, literally. It is blindingly obvious who the winners and who are the losers in this deal. Australia's economy will benefit to the tune of $1.3 billion a year. The UK government's own assessment says that the Australian deal is worth just, and I quote, zero 0.02% of GDP. Mr Speaker, you would need 200 Australian deals to come close to mitigating the cost of Brexit. We were told that Brexit was all about taking back control. But for our farmers and for our crofters, there's been no scrutiny, there's been no consultation and there's been no consent. So if the Prime Minister is really confident about the benefits of this deal. Does he have the guts to put it to a vote in this House? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the, the people of this country voted uh, for this government to get on and deliver free trade deals around the world. And uh, I believe they were totally right. Uh, he talks about about tripe, Mr Speaker. Well, I can tell him uh, that when it comes to exporting the intestines of, uh, of sheep, uh, which I know is a, valu a valuable part of Scottish uh, tradition, e even that uh, is now being opened up around the world thanks to the deals that this country is doing. And, uh, and uh, uh, Mr Speaker, if, if, he, if he is saying, if he is saying uh, that he wants to go back uh, into the EU, hand back control of our fisheries, hand back control of our agriculture to Brussels, uh, lose all the opportunities that this country has gained, I think he is frankly out of his mind and, and going in totally the wrong direction. And if he means a referendum, another referendum, Mr Speaker, we had one of those. Can I just say gently to everybody, we need no need to turbocharge questions and answers. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thanks to our unique geography, 
the high peak has some of the worst broadband and mobile coverage gaps anywhere in the country. We are making good progress, but can I urge the Prime Minister to redouble efforts in the rollout of ultra-fast broadband, to, especially to hard-to-reach rural areas like the High Peak? And can I suggest that the Government builds on the success of the Kickstart scheme with more focused support for key infrastructure industries so that we can recruit a new generation of highly skilled broadband engineers to turbocharge the rollout? Yes. Prime Minister. Uh, I thank my honourable friend, but my honourable friend, he's, he's absolutely right. And uh, that's why we're working with industry to accelerate our uh, rural network and uh, coverage across the whole of the UK has massively increased and will be increasing thanks to the steps that we're taking. Sir Geoffrey Dons. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I know, like me, the Prime Minister cares passionately about the Union. Can the Prime Minister therefore confirm that the passing of the EU Withdrawal Act and the Northern Ireland Protocol that forms part of it has not resulted in an implied repeal of Article 6 of the Act of Union, which enables Northern Ireland to trade freely with the rest of this United Kingdom? And will he commit to fully restoring Northern Ireland's place within the UK internal market? Yes. Prime Minister. Uh, yes, of course, Mr Speaker. I can give assurances on both uh, those counts, and I can say that unless we uh, see uh, progress on the implementation of the protocol, which I think is currently uh, totally uh, disproportionate, then uh, we will have to take the necessary steps uh, to do exactly what he says. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that the rebuild of Hillingdon Hospital will be a great benefit to his constituents and mine? And will he commit to working with me and other local members of Parliament and potential future MPs like Peter Fleet and Chesham and Amersham to secure the future of services at Hillingdon's other site, Mount Vernon, in my constituency, which provides specialist medical treatments to a very wide catchment area. Yes. Prime Minister. Uh, I thank my honourable friend. He's totally right about Hillingdon uh, Hospital, which has a, uh, a great future, and uh, we will make sure, and I look forward to working uh, with him uh, and to make sure that the future of services at Mount Vernon uh, is, all, is also uh, protected, and I know that a full consultation is due to start in September. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Kevin, a hotel manager in Oxford, contacted me last week because he's worried. Because even if this country does open up in the next few weeks, he won't be able to run at full capacity due to chronic staff shortages. Local staff are leaving the industry because of the uncertainty caused by this government's bungled handling of this pandemic. The EU staff have already left because of the botched handling of Brexit. And he can't recruit from abroad because of the damaging new immigration policy. This is the Prime Minister's wake-up call. Oxfordshire's economy alone relies on the hospitality industry to the tune of £2.5 billion. Will the government introduce a Covid recovery visa to help Kevin recruit the staff he desperately needs? Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, it's absolutely true that as we open up our economy there, is, uh, a, uh, there are more vacancies and that's, that's great. Uh, but we also have large numbers of people in this country, Mr Speaker, large numbers of, of young people uh, who need jobs uh, and large numbers of people who are still furloughed. And I think what we want to see is those people coming forward to get those jobs. But of course, we will, re we will retain uh, an open and a flexible approach towards allowing talent to come in from overseas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister knows the full value of the UK shellfish industry and the opportunity potential that there is. This week, the Food Standards Agency produced a list of recommendations that will allow us to regrade our waters, challenge anomalous results. However, those recommendations only come in September this year. Will the Prime Minister flex his muscles and see yeah. if the report and the recommendation can be brought forward to the end of this month. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I will do everything I can uh, to ensure that uh, we accelerate this uh, process. He's right to raise it. A great deal of progress has already been made and uh, the Food Standards Agency has, I think, been uh, flexible, but we need to go further and uh, we'll make sure that great British shellfish can continue to be exported uh, to Europe and around the world. Marine fellows. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The UK government's trade deal with Australia has been made with no consultation, no consent, and no parliamentary scrutiny. The president of the National Farmers Union of Scotland has said our seafood industry has already been hit hard by Brexit, and now Scottish farming will be sacrificed. Again, it's Scotland's key industries which will bear the brunt of a Tory Brexit people in Scotland did not vote for. 
Does the Prime Minister think these concerns from NFU Scotland President, and does he accept them, or does he think that he knows better? Minister. Mrs Biggie, you would think from listening to the SNP that there, were, there was no uh, Scotch whisky industry or no banking and financial services industries uh, in, in Scotland, but even then uh, they're missing the point because this is a massive opportunity for the Scottish agriculture sector. And what, they need, what they need is a different type of MP, uh, Mr Speaker, who can champion them, who can get behind them, who actually believes in Scotland, uh, Mr Speaker. That's what the people of Scotland need. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One of the reasons for the popularity of the Prime Minister is that he's always been on the side, he's always been on the, side of the public rather than on the side of the establishment. Given that, overall, given that overall deaths in the UK over the last 13 weeks are 8,873 below the five-year average, which includes the time the Indian variant has been around, can my right hon. Friend explain why? Instead of trusting his world-leading vaccine programme, the common sense of the British people and his conservative instincts of individual freedom and individual responsibility, he instead prefers to trust people like Professor Susan Mickey at SAGE, a long-standing member of the Communist Party, who last week let the cat out of the bag and said she wanted some Covid restrictions to last forever. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, nobody, uh, uh, least of all uh, I or uh, my honourable friend, want to see Covid restrictions uh, last forever, nor do I think that they are uh, going to last uh, forever, Mr Speaker. As I made clear earlier this week, I think we can have a high degree of confidence that our, programme, our vaccination programme will work, and I think we need to give it a little bit uh, more time, as I have explained, uh, to save many thousands more lives by vaccinating millions more people. That's what we want to do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My constituent Ross has been invited to sit his driving theory test in Oban, 100 miles away from his home in Hamilton. His test has already been cancelled twice, first in November last year and then February 2021. This September, Ross is starting a university course in paramedic science with a view to becoming a qualified paramedic in the Scottish Ambulance Service with placements across Scotland. Being able to drive is crucial. Will the Prime Minister meet with me to discuss the delays in the scheduling of DVSA theory tests and the impracticality of the locations being offered? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, Prime Minister. I, I, I thank the Honourable Lady. I, I am aware of the, of the problem and we are doing what we can to accelerate uh, the number of, uh, of driving instructors and testers so uh, to allow young people such as the, uh, the, the gentleman she mentions to get their, their driving test done uh, and enable them to fulfil their, their ambitions. Mr Speaker, I support uh, the Prime Minister's comments on Joe Cox and also, as uh, a former Chief Whip, his comment on Sir Roy Stone. Sir Roy gave amazing service to me as Chief Whip during the worst of the Brexit years in dealing with the hung parliament and with the odd occasional disruptive that venture. <laughs> Mr Speaker, um, Northern Ireland faces some challenges uh, over the coming weeks in terms of nominating a first and deputy first minister. Uh, would the Prime Minister agree with me that it's vital uh, that uh, parties stick to the agreements that have been made, the new decade, new approach which he and I negotiated 18 months ago, uh, and that in failing uh, to do that, uh, we ultimately, and I know he doesn't like this concept, that the UK Government does act as a backstop? Yes. Prime Minister. Uh, I, I, well, Mr Speaker, it gives me great pleasure to thank uh, my right honourable friend for all the work that he did in the new decade, new approach uh, deal. Uh, and uh, I, I do agree that uh, it would be a good thing for the whole package to be uh, agreed. And I, and, and, and I certainly support the approach that he, uh, that he set out. And I think that what the, the people in Northern Ireland want is a, is a stable, functioning and mature executive. Kenny McCaskill. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A new Lord Advocate is taking up position, but the structural flaws in the office remain. In no other legal jurisdiction in the UK, or indeed in the Western world, is the government's senior legal adviser simultaneously the country's chief prosecutor. Yet the role is enshrined in the Scotland Act 1988. Will the Prime Minister commit to changes so that this historical anachronism can be changed and a separation of powers be achieved? Prime Minister. Uh, well, first of all, Mr. Speaker, I congratulate the 
uh, honourable gentleman on, his, on the outstanding success of his party in the recent uh, elections. Uh, but uh, I, will, I will study the anomaly that he, uh, he raises and, re and revert to him uh, as soon as possible. Ruth Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome the publication of the Tigger report today, um, published by my right honourable friend for Chingford and Woodford Green, my right honourable friend for Chipping Barnet, and my honourable friend for Mid-Norfolk. The report makes recommendations about how to seize new opportunities from Brexit and back start-ups and new tech. Will my right honourable friend look closely at that report so that we can make the most of the great benefits of Brexit and lead the world in the development of new technologies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker, I thank my uh, honourable and right honourable friends for their excellent report and I think it's time to, to put a tigger in the tank. Ellen Davies. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate myself with the remarks concerning the fifth anniversary of the murder of Joe Cox? Joe was a dear personal friend and colleague who will always be missed and remembered and whose extraordinary legacy endures far beyond this place. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, last month a fire in an East London block of flats caused three people to be hospitalised and dozens more to be treated for smoke inhalation. That block was one of more than 200 high-rise buildings in England, still fitted with Grenfell-style cladding. I asked the Prime Minister, why is it that four years after the Grenfell tragedy took 72 lives, after all the warnings, all the tireless campaigning and the unspeakable injustice, people are still living in unsafe flats and his government has failed to end the cladding scandal. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Minister. Speaker, we have invested massively in removing cladding from, uh, from high-rise blocks. We'll continue to do so. I know the, bill, the, the structure in question, uh, the, the Ballymore, the company concerned, I, I do believe would, uh, are too slow and we are on their case, Mr Speaker. But I think it is very, very important. Uh, very, very important uh, that people understand that overall risks of death by fire have been coming down for a very long time and will continue to come down. And it is simply not the case that all the high rise buildings in this country are unsafe. And it's very important that members of parliament should stress that. Paul Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Independent lifeboat stations like the Hamble lifeboat in my constituency respond to over 100 incidents a year in the Solent. The pandemic has increased the operating costs of independent lifeboat stations while also restricting their ability to raise money. Will the Prime Minister to look, look to see to what more the government can do to support independent lifeboat stations like the Hamble lifeboat as they keep a watchful eye on all of us? Yes. Prime Minister. Uh, yes, indeed, Mr. Speaker. I thank my honourable friend uh, for raising the excellent work of Hamble uh, lifeboats and uh, the, my, in April last year, uh, my right on for the Chancellor put forward another £750 million in support of uh, charities such as the one he mentions. Sure, Martin, Martin. Mr Speaker, at two venues in Glasgow, hospitality venues called Blue Dog and Adlib, staff there have had no furlough payments since the summer of last year. Having raised this with HMRC directly, the situation still hasn't moved forward. If I send him the details, will he knock heads together help the staff whose bills are going unpaid and debts are rising and get the cash into their accounts they're entitled to. So we'll be very happy to look at it, Mr Speaker. Liam Legg. Um, when can we expect the coordinated chorus of SAGE members recommencing their media appearances to depress Burrell? And does my right honourable friend fear having to give another press conference at which he again postpones the return of our freedoms? Mr Speaker, we are rightly told that we need to learn to live with Covid. So what can the Prime Minister say to the country to convince us of that reality? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I believe that academic and scientific freedom are an invaluable part of our, uh, our country. Uh, and uh, I, also, I also note that uh, my scientific colleagues would echo uh, my sentiments that we need to learn to live with COVID, Mr Speaker. Sue Macdonald. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This government's two-child cap and its childcare proof-of-payment rules mean my hard-working constituent, Miss Cowan, who's a single parent on universal credit supporting four kids, faces £1,000 of nursery arrears. She's therefore at risk of losing their nursery places. She would therefore have to give up work and would therefore be at risk of sanction and forced further into debt and poverty. Can the Prime Minister help my constituent out of this trap and will he fix these rules that are pushing people out of work and into poverty? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'll be happy to study the case, but the whole point of universal credit, uh, which this government introduces, it's helping uh, hundreds of thousands of people into work, it's a, and, and that is its success. 
Jason McCall. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I associate myself with the comments of the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition about our friend Joe Cox. Will the Prime Minister join me in congratulating rugby league legend Kevin Sinfield for his OBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours? Yeah. Kevin has done so much to raise awareness of motor neurone disease yeah. and support his good friend Rob Burrow. MND is a devastating uh, disease. There's no cure, but scientists, Mr Speaker, believe they're on the cusp of developing effective treatments. So will the government please commit to investing £50 million over five years to establish a virtual MND research institute and accelerate research? Prime Minister, I totally agree with that. It should have been a night. Come on, now. Well, thank you. And it's an OBE, Mr Speaker. I also thank uh, Kevin Fitzinville uh, very much for his outstanding work and uh, we're following it up uh, with uh, we're spending £55 uh, million pounds on research into, into MND, but there will be more to come uh, as part of our general massive investment in, in life sciences. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The trade deal the Prime Minister has struck, simply put, means undercutting our farmers, mm -hmm. shortchanging consumers, mm -hmm. and it will set animal welfare standards mm -hmm. back by decades. Mm -hmm. yep. The RSPCA have said that the Prime Minister's deal will, and I quote, start a race to the bottom mm -hmm. and the losers will be mm -hmm. billions of farmed animals and UK farmers. Does the Prime Minister accept these concerns from the experts at the RSPCA or does he think that he knows better? Prime Minister. I really think that these constant attacks on Australia and their standards and their animal welfare standards would be very, very much resented by the people of Australia and they would, be, they not, would not be recognised. Actually, Australia is marked five out of five, which is the highest possible, by the World Organisation of Animal Health Performance and Veterinary Services Evaluation Team for Animal Welfare. And uh, this deal, Mr Speaker, that we've done is the first ever to incorporate high animal welfare status, uh, standards as part of the package that Australia has agreed. Lucy Allen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will my right honourable friend join me in paying tribute to assisted dying campaigner Noel Conway, who has died after taking the decision to have his breathing support removed? And does my right honourable friend agree that it is now time for Parliament to properly consider the law on assisted dying? Yeah. Yeah. Prime well, Mr Speaker, I believe this is a subject on which there are, and I thank uh, my, my honourable friend, uh, and I, I know that the whole House will be in sympathy with Noel Conway's family and Friends, uh, the, there are very, very deeply and sincerely held views on both sides of this matter, uh, and a change uh, in the law would be one, obviously, for Parliament to consider. Owen Thompson. Yes. Mr. Speaker, over the course of this question session, the Prime Minister has been presented with the views of, of stakeholder after stakeholder expressing real fears and concerns over these bungled trade talks. Why is the Prime Minister willing to put the livelihoods of farmers and crofters across Scotland in peril for a shoddy trade deal with Australia that won't even cover 1% of the lost opportunities to Europe's markets that we've lost through Brexit? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we haven't lost opportunities to Europe's markets through Brexit. Final question, Ben Spencer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In 2014, Runnymede and Weybridge was hit by devastating floods and my constituents live under the fear of flooding. Last week, the government signed off the outline business case for the River Thames Flood Alleviation Scheme, which will allow the detailed design and planning for this scheme to begin in earnest. It's fantastic news, a monumental milestone, will massively improve our protection from flooding. Will the Prime Minister join me in celebrating, thanking everyone who's got to this point and where we are, and agreeing with me we need to keep the momentum going? Minister. I thank my honourable friend, he's completely right, and the, uh, the uh, £501 million River Thames Scheme. Uh, will reduce the flood risk uh, for 11,000 homes and 16,000 uh, businesses, and I thank him uh, for raising it with me today. That concludes the questions, so I'm now going to go straight to the statement. I now call the Prime Minister to make the statement. Prime Minister. <laughs> Mr Speaker, with permission, I will make a statement on the G7 summit I chaired in Carbis Bay and the NATO summit in Brussels. Let me first thank the people of Cornwall, Carbis Bay, St Dives, uh, for welcoming the representatives of the world's most powerful democracies to their home. An enchanting setting for the first gathering of G7 leaders in two years, the first since the pandemic began, and President Biden's first overseas visit since taking office. Our aim was to demonstrate how the world's democracies are ready and able to address the world's toughest problems, offering solutions and backing them up with concrete action. 
The G7 will combine our strengths and expertise to defeat COVID, minimise the risk of another pandemic, and build back better, fairer and greener for the benefit of all. Alongside our partners, the G7 is now engaged in the biggest and fastest vaccination programme in history, designed to protect the whole world by the end of next year. My fellow leaders agreed to supply developing countries with another billion doses, either directly or through other channels, of which 100 million will come from the UK. The world's most popular vaccine was developed here, and the express purpose of the deal between the British Government, Oxford University and AstraZeneca was to create an, inocul an inoculation that would be easy to, distort, to store, quick to distribute and available at cost price or zero profit to protect as many people as possible. The results are becoming clearer every day. Over 500 million Oxford AstraZeneca vaccines have been administered in 168 countries so far, accounting for 96% of the doses distributed to developing nations by COVAX, the global alliance that the UK helped to establish. With every passing hour, people are being protected across the world and lives saved by the formidable expertise that the UK was able to assemble. But all the efforts of this country and of many others, no matter how generous and far-sighted, would be futile in the face of another lethal, lethal virus that might escape our efforts. So the G7 has agreed to support a global pandemic radar to spot new pathogens before they begin to spread, allowing immediate containment. And in case a new virus gets through anyway, our scientists will embark on a mission to develop the ability to create new vaccines, treatments and tests in just 100 days compared to the 300 required for COVID. Even as we persevere against this virus, my fellow leaders share my determination to look beyond today's crisis and build back better, greener and fairer. If we can learn anything from this tragedy, we have at least been given a chance to break with the past and do things better and do them differently. This time, as our economies rebound, we must avoid the mistakes we made after the financial crash of 2008 and ensure that everyone benefits from the recovery. The surest way of our future prosperity is to design fair and open rules and standards for the new frontiers of the global economy. So the G7 will devise a fairer tax system for global corporations, reversing the race to the bottom, and strive to ensure that new technology serves as a force for prosperity and hope, strengthening freedom and openness. My fellow leaders will act as one against an increasing injustice, the denial of an education to millions of girls across the world, by working to get another 40 million girls into school by 2025. I'm happy to say that the G7 agreed to provide more than half of the five billion sought by the Global Partnership for Education to transform the prospects of millions of children in developing countries, and 430 million pounds will come from the UK. Our duty to future generations compels us to protect our planet from catastrophic climate change. And every country in the G7 has promised to achieve net zero by 2050, wiping out our contribution to global warming from that date onwards. And to achieve that target, we will halve our carbon emissions by 2030 compared with 2010 levels. The G7 resolved to end any government support for unabated coal-fired power generation overseas and increase and improve climate finance between now and 2025. We will consecrate 30% of our land and sea to nature, protecting vast areas in all their abundance and diversity of life, giving millions of species the chance to recover from the ravages of recent decades. And it is precisely because safeguarding our planet requires global action that the G7 will offer developing countries a new partnership, the Build Back Better World, to help construct a new and clean and green infrastructure in a way that is transparent and environmentally responsible. There is no contradiction between averting climate change and creating highly skilled and well-paid jobs, both in our country 
and around the world. We can and will achieve both by means of a green industrial revolution at home and green infrastructure aboard, abroad. I was honoured to welcome our friends, the leaders of India, South Korea, Australia and South Africa as guests in Carbis Bay and virtually, of course, in the case of the Prime Minister of India. And on Monday, Scott Morrison and I were delighted to reach a free trade agreement between the UK and Australia, creating fantastic opportunities for both our countries, eliminating tariffs on all British exports, whether Scotch whisky or cars from the Midlands, and making it easier for young British people to live and work in Australia. We've also included protections for British farmers over the next 15 years and unprecedented protections and provisions for animal welfare. And this House will, of course, be able to scrutinise the agreement once the texts are finalised. This is exactly how Global Britain will help to generate jobs and opportunities at home and level up our whole United Kingdom. Our agreement with Australia is a vital step towards the even greater prize of the UK joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a $9 trillion free trade area embracing the fastest growing economies of the world. Together with the G7, the countries represented at Carbis Bay comprise a democratic 11. Free nations living on five continents, spanning different faiths and cultures, but united by a shared belief in liberty, democracy and human rights. Those ideals were encapsulated in the Atlantic Charter, agreed by Winston Churchill and President Roosevelt in 1941, when Britain was the only surviving democracy in Europe and the very existence of our freedom was in peril. The courage and valour of millions of people ensured our ideals survived and flourished. And 80 years on, President Biden and I met within sight of HMS Prince of Wales, the Royal Navy's newest aircraft carrier and the linear successor of the battleship on which the original charter was devised. And we agreed a new Atlantic Charter, encompassing the full breadth of British and American cooperation in science, technology, trade and global security. The surest guarantee of our security is NATO, which protects a billion people in 30 countries and the summit in Brussels on Monday agreed the wholesale modernisation of the Alliance to meet new dangers, including in space and cyber cyberspace, reflecting the priorities of our own integrated review of foreign and defence policy. Britain has the biggest defence budget in Europe, comfortably exceeding the NATO target of 2% of national income. We have committed our nuclear deterrent and our cyber capabilities to the Alliance, and we contribute more troops than any other country's uh, to, to NATO's than any other country to NATO's deployment to protect Poland and the Baltic states. We do more for the security of our continent than any other European power, showing that we mean it when we say that an attack on any NATO ally shall be considered an attack on all, a pledge that has kept the peace for over 70 years and which President Biden reaffirmed on behalf of the United States. Together, these two summits showed the enduring strength of the Atlantic Alliance and the bonds we treasure with kindred democracies across the globe. They provided the best possible foundation for COP26 in Glasgow in November, when the UK will bring the whole world together in a common cause. They demonstrated how global Britain creates jobs at home while striving in unison with our friends for a greener, safer and fairer world. And Mr Speaker, I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Welcome to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for advance sight of his statement? Mr Speaker, it was a Labour government and a Labour Foreign Secretary, Ernest Bevin, that helped found NATO. Yeah. And it's an alliance that Labour will always value and protect. And so we welcome agreement on the NATO 2030 agenda, in particular strengthening NATO's cyber security capability. We also welcome the deepening support for our friends and allies in Ukraine and Georgia, recognition of the global security implications of the climate emergency, 
and for the first time of the challenges that China poses to global security and stability. On the UK-Austria trade deal, Mr Speaker, we all want to see Britain taking trading opportunities around the world, but the devil will be in the detail, and we look forward to scrutinising this deal in Parliament, in particular for its impact on British farmers and on food standards. Mr Speaker, turning to the G7 summit, this should have been the most important G7 in a generation, the first of the recovery, the first with a new US president, a chance for Britain to lead the world as we did at Glen Eagles in 2005 or after the global financial crisis in 2009. But whether on global vaccination, the climate emergency, Middle East peace or the Northern Ireland Protocol, this summit ended up as a wasted opportunity. Mr Speaker, the priority for the summit had to be a clear pan plan to vaccinate the world. This is not just a moral imp imperative, it's in our self-interest, as the Delta variant makes clear. Without global vaccine coverage, this virus will continue to boomerang, bringing more variants and more disruption to these shores. The World Health Organization has said that 11 billion doses are needed, 11 billion doses. This summit promised less than one-tenth of that. No new funding, no plan to build a global vaccine capability, capacity, and no progress on patent waivers. Mr Speaker, the headlines of a billion doses may be what the Prime Minister wanted, but it's not what the world needed. The same is true of the climate emergency. This is the single greatest challenge the world will face in decades to come. But this summit saw no progress on climate finance. The communique speaks only of commitments already made and of those yet to be made. There was no plan, let alone a Marshall plan, to speed up cuts to global emissions. And there was little in the communique beyond existing commitments. Mr Speaker, this summit was meant to be a stepping stone to COP26. But if anything, it was a step back. It was also disappointing that there was nothing to suggest any progress was made to restart Middle East peace process. A new government in Israel, combined with a new US president, provides a real opportunity to end the injustice and to finally deliver an independent and sovereign Palestine alongside a safe and secure Israel. And the resumption, sadly, of hostilities overnight shows the price of that failure. So can I ask the Prime Minister if he discussed this with world leaders, including President Biden? The summit should also have been an opportunity to, res to resolve, not inflame tensions over the Northern Ireland Protocol. It started with an unprecedented diplomatic rebuke from our closest allies, and it ended with the White House still speaking of candid discussions. And it was overshadowed by the failure of the Prime Minister to make the deal that he negotiated, he negotiated, work. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister may think this is all part of a grand diplomatic game, but Northern Ireland is far too serious for that. When a Prime Minister loses the trust of our allies and trashes Britain's reputation for upholding, upholding international law, it's hardly surprising that we're left isolated and unable to lead. Mr Speaker, despite all this, I have no doubt the Prime Minister will be pleased with the G7 because it delivered, it delivered everything that he wanted. Some good headlines, some nice photos and even a row with the French over sausages. But that just shows, that just shows how narrow the Prime Minister's ambition for Britain really is. It's why this was never going to be a Glen Eagles type style success and why the Prime Minister played the role of host but not leader of tour guide, but not statesman. Yeah. On those terms, this G7 was a success. On any other, it was a failure. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I think in a, in a long career of miserabilism and defeatism, uh, I think he's, he's, he's really ex ex excelled himself there. Uh, let me, let me, it was, it was a, 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 a very powerful statement after a long and difficult period uh, in which the world came together and uh, decided to build back better 
for the world. And uh, one of the things he, he didn't mention was, of course, uh, the fantastic agreement uh, we reached uh, to, to come together and support the whole of the, de of the developing world, which I, th I think he should approve of, uh, in, in allowing them uh, to have access to clean, green technology financed by the multilateral, multinational development banks, but bringing in the private sector from around the world. It's a fantastic step forward uh, for the world. He, 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 he nickels and dimes uh, what happened on vaccines. I think it was fantastic uh, that, the, that the world agreed, the world agreed, on top of the billion uh, we've already done, uh, the world agreed another billion, another billion vaccines, Mr. Speaker, uh, when, we're, when, when people are, are racing to vaccinate their own populations. They agreed another billion uh, vaccines uh, from the G7, 100 million more from this country. And, and you're always constantly running this country's efforts down, Mr. Speaker. Of the 1.5 billion uh, COVAX vaccines that have already been distributed, let me remind him 500 million of them are directly due to the efforts of this country, uh, which has given £1.6 billion uh, to supporting COVAX uh, and, and, and another £546 uh, to, to supporting Gavi. As for as for climate change, I mean, I don't know what, what, what plan he's on, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are, we, this was an extraordinary achievement by the summit in uh, getting, not only did all countries commit to, to net zero by, by 2050, but we're, we're very largely there, we we're a long way there in getting, uh, in getting the 100 billion uh, we need for climate change, uh, climate change financing, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, he he, he uh, complains about uh, uh, the, the Northern Ireland uh, Protocol, Mr Speaker. It's not at all clear uh, what he believes himself. It's not at all clear. Uh, he says he's not in favour of, of checks of the, of the Northern Irish, uh, of the border between uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. There should be no border. He's, he says he's quite right. Then what is his policy? Uh, that's exactly what this government is standing for. I'd like to, I'd like to understand what he actually stands for, uh, for once, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, finally, Finally, Mr. Speaker, we, are, we, are, we, want, we want to get rid of those checks, and if he will support us in, in doing so, then I would, I would be glad, grateful, finally, for his support. Uh, he, he said that the, he, I think he said something positive about the NATO uh, summit. Uh, I'm glad of that. Though it's, it's striking uh, that he's not joined by, uh, uh, for once by the shadow uh, foreign secretary on, on these benches, uh, since, as far, since she, it is still her view, as far as I can remember, that we should get rid of the nuclear deterrent, our own nuclear deterrent, on which our NATO security guarantee uh, r r relies. And as for, the, as, for the trade deal, as for the trade deal with Australia, Mr Speaker, as for the Maybe that's not her. But maybe she's changed it. As for the trade deal with Australia, uh, Mr. Speaker, the the shadow the shadow uh, international trade secretary has herself said uh, that she doesn't think it possible for the UK to export uh, food and drink to Australia because, to quote uh, her, it goes off. Mr. Speaker, it, it goes off. Uh, actually, this country exports £350 million worth of food and drink. Uh, he should congratulate uh, UK exporters, support the free trade deal, and stop being so generally down in the mouth about everything. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can I uh, welcome my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister's leadership of the G7 over the weekend and many of its successful uh, outcomes? Uh, but during the G7, the United States uh, propose that they adopt, all of them, a common strategy on China's disgusting use of forced labour and confront them. I understand that some of the European countries dissented from this approach, and I therefore ask my honourable friend, uh, does he stand with President Biden on this issue, not his dissenters? And if so, will he emphasise this by informing the House when the government will bring forward its promised export controls to keep goods made by Uyghur slave labour off our shelves and the promised changes to the Modern Slavery Act. These are very important, and the Prime Minister can re-emphasise his strong credentials. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, um, I'm grateful, my honourable friend. We've already put in uh, Magnitsky sanctions against uh, those involved in, uh, in forced labour uh, uh, in, uh, in Xinjiang, and uh, we will continue to have very tough export measures, or import measures, import controls on any such produce. The SMP in black. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Prime Minister for advance sight of his statement. After a week of ascending to the heady heights of hosting global leaders, I can sense just how thrilled the Prime Minister is to be back in this House 
answering questions from us mere mortals. But even us mere mortals, looking at the G7 from afar, we can detect the difference between a welcoming host and an influential leader. Because even a raft of carefully crafted photo opportunities in Cornwall couldn't hide the fact that this Prime Minister and his government are deeply diminished on the world stage. Mm. Mr Speaker, the UK is the only G7 country cutting overseas aid, the only G7 country being questioned about its commitment to previously signed international treaties, and the UK remains the G7 country with the smallest, the smallest COVID stimulus package. So whilst the Prime Minister may have hoped to relaunch Global Britain, what was really on show over the last week was Brexit Britain, a more isolated and a less influential place. Prior to the summit, the Prime Minister built up the prospects of a new Marshall Plan, promoting climate action in developing countries. But what was announced appeared to be a repackaging of previous announcements. So I can see the Prime Minister shaking his head. So can I ask him to confirm, Prime Minister, the exact figure the UK will contribute to this Marshall Plan for climate action? On COVID recovery, President Biden openly encouraged other leaders to embrace the economic logic of an investment-led recovery instead of returning to the failed policy of austerity cuts. Does the Prime Minister agree with that economic logic? And can he therefore explain why the UK has the smallest COVID stimulus package of any G7 country? And finally, in terms of the NATO summit, can the Prime Minister detail what concrete proposals were agreed to apply appropriate pressure to protect the human rights of the persecuted Uyghur Muslim minority in China. Prime Minister. Um, Mr Speaker, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the Uyghurs in, in China, the, the, no concrete measures were discussed at, uh, at NATO, but I've, uh, as I've said in my answer to my, uh, my rather honourable friend, uh, we remain uh, in this country uh, uh, implacably committed to opposing the uh, uh, forced labour there and to, and to sanctioning uh, those who, who profit from, uh, from the forced, forced labour in, in Xinjiang. I, I think his characterisation of the summit is, 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 is as erroneous as that of the Right Honourable Gentleman. Uh, it, we, it was a, a fantastically successful summit in bringing the world together on, uh, on vaccination uh, on, and on tackling uh, climate change. And as for the, the UK's own contribution, uh, which he deprecates, uh, it's massive. And I think the people of this country will think it astonishing uh, at, a time, at a time when we've been through a pandemic and uh, we've spent £407 billion uh, looking after jobs and livelihoods uh, in, this countryhood, in this country, that we're still able, uh, we're still able, and I'll give him the figure, uh, we're still able to supply £11.6 billion, 11 .6 billion uh, to help de the developing world uh, tackle the consequences of climate change. And he should be proud of that and not run his country down. Drew Mitchell. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend's significant, significant success at the G7 last weekend has sadly been dented by the fact that Britain is the only G7 country cutting vital aid and doing so in the middle of a global pandemic. That decision is not only doing grave damage to the reputation of global Britain, it will also lead to more than 100,000 avoidable deaths, principally amongst women and children. Will my right honourable friend reflect on the fact that many of us in all parts of the Parliamentary Party are urging him to restore these terrible humanitarian cuts and that we are not, as he suggested in Prime Minister's questions last week, uh, lefty propagandists, uh, but his political friends, allies and supporters who want him to think again. Prime Minister. Uh, well, uh, Mr Speaker, I have uh, the utmost respect for my vulnerable friend's uh, record in, uh, in overseas aid, but I have to say that uh, the uh, changes that we've made to ODA weren't, have not been raised with me by anybody at the G7, not, not, nor, Mr Speaker, by any recipient uh, country. And that is because, uh, and I've talked to many of them, I've talked to many of them, and that is because they know, 
They know, Mr Speaker, that the United Kingdom remains one of the biggest donors in the world, second in the G7, and in spite of all the difficulties we've been going through, is contributing £10 billion, pounds, Mr Speaker, uh, to supporting countries this year, Mr Speaker, to supporting countries around the world. And we've just increased, Mr Speaker, our spending on female education. That was one thing people did raise with me, and they, and they, and they raised it with me to congratulate the UK Government on what we were doing. And I think people in this country should be very proud of the contributions that they're making. Let's go to Ed Davey. Ed. The Prime Minister waxed lyrical about the fight against climate change, but only after stepping off his private jet. He made the case for investing in girls' education around the world, yet he's cutting the amount we spend on it by 40% this year. He talked up the importance of international agreements while reneging on the one he signed. And he advocated the importance of democracy while introducing plans to make it harder for people to vote in this country. Mr Speaker, when will the Prime Minister realise that his approach of do as I say, not as I do, is ruinous to Britain's reputation on the world stage? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I, I think the Liberal Democrats should get their, their facts right. We're not cutting uh, spending on... Uh, on, on girls' education, uh, to pick one uh, of the points he made, uh, we, we are actually increasing it by at least 15%. Uh, £432 million we're spending on the Global Partnership uh, for Education, Mr Speaker. And, I, and when you look at what this country is doing on, uh, on, on tackling climate change, the commitment uh, to, to net zero, uh, that was actually made after uh, we were in coalition with the Right Honourable Gentleman, freed from the shackles of Lib Dem hypocrisy, uh, Mr Speaker. We were able to, we were, we were able to get on uh, with some serious work and commit, under my premiership, Mr Speaker, freed from the uselessness of the Lib Dems, to an 11.6 billion commitment to helping the people of the world to tackle climate change, Mr Speaker. People who, uh, he should realise that for, for people who really care about tackling climate change, allowing the world to build back cleaner and greener and better, listening to him, frankly, he's making it harder, not just to vote, he's making it harder to vote Lib Dem anyway. Sir Bernard Jenkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does my right honourable friend recall President Macron insisting that nothing in the Northern Ireland Protocol is negotiable, even though he admits it contains what he calls inconsistencies? But if the peace and stability of Northern Ireland is being undermined by the application of the Protocol, then it is obvious that the Protocol itself must be renegotiated. How could anyone seriously consider otherwise? So will he urge the EU not to give precedence to the protocol over the priest process and the Good Friday Agreement? And will he remind them of the 2017 joint report, uh, which included the aspiration that the then backstop would be removed via negotiations and what they call specific solutions? Can he pursue that policy? Prime Minister. Yeah, Mr Speaker, the, the problem at the moment is the application of the protocol, because uh, the protocol makes it very clear that uh, there should be no distortions of, of trade and that the Good Friday uh, peace process, above all, must be, uh, must be upheld. But it is being applied in, a, uh, in, in such a way as to uh, destabilise that uh, peace process, and it's being applied, I think, in a, uh, in a, in a highly asymmetrical way. And all we're asking for is some, uh, a, a pragmatic approach, and I'm sure that uh, I hope very much that we'll get that, but if we can't get that, then uh, we'll certainly take the steps that he describes. Monday's Australian trade deal announcement revealed the Prime Minister's fear of democratic accountability. He's withheld details of the agreement and prevented Parliament from doing our proper job of scrutiny at the proper time. Yet, from day one, Australian farmers will be able to export over 60 times more beef before UK tariffs kick in. That's no tariff whatsoever on up to 35,000 tonnes of potentially low welfare beef. So, from day one, will he at least commit to an annual assessment of the economic impact of his deal on Welsh beef and lamb farmers? Prime Minister. 
Mr Speaker, I repeat the points I made to uh, many members opposite. Uh, this is an opportunity for UK farming and, for, and indeed for, for Welsh farmers. And uh, she, she speaks with apprehension about uh, 35,000 tonnes of, uh, of Australian beef. We already import about 300,000 tonnes uh, of, uh, of EU beef. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, about, about 300,000 tonnes of EU beef. Australian farmers observe a very, very high animal welfare standards, and they will only get a complete free tariff, tariff-free access uh, after 15 years. Mr. Speaker, after 15 years, we're going to give uh, people in Australia uh, the same rights of access as we give uh, 27 other EU countries. Rexman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The recent agreements on cyber defence policy and technological cooperation announced at the NATO summit in Brussels will mean that the alliance remains as strong as ever when faced with new threats. So, will my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, confirm that he remains utterly committed to NATO as the foundation of our collective security? Prime Minister. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker. NATO has protected the world and, uh, and uh, particularly the European continent for 72 years and it was clear from the conversation around the table uh, that it will continue to do so for decades to come. Let's go to Gregory Campbell. Gregory. Thank you Mr Speaker. The uh, reports are emanating from the summit that Mr Mancron doesn't seem to understand the constitutional parameters of the United Kingdom given he thought we were part of a different country. Will he take steps to ensure that all our partners know what those parameters are? And will he also take great care in the next few days and weeks not to even further jeopardise devolution in Northern Ireland that has been put in jeopardy in the past few days as a result of Sinn Féin's actions? Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Honourable Gentleman. What we want to do is to uh, strengthen uh, Northern Ireland and strengthen Northern Ireland's place within the United Kingdom, and that's what we're going to be doing. Liam Fawkes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I congratulate my right honourable friend for the success of, of the G7, which I think did Britain proud. But can I ask him about the NATO summit, and in particular, whether there were any discussions about the role for the Alliance in the maintenance and protection of energy security, in particular, the need to reduce dependence on Russia? And can I ask him specifically if there were any discussions about the strategic vulnerability being introduced to Europe by the German selfish obsession uh, for the Nord Stream 2 project? And if such a discussion did not occur, can you please ensure that it does? Prime Minister. Uh, I, I, I don't think I'm giving anything away, Mr Speaker, but I told my right honourable friend uh, that uh, there were certainly discussions about the vital importance of uh, all of us getting to, to net zero and avoiding uh, a dependence on hydrocarbons, uh, whether that's strategically unwise uh, or not. Let's go to Caroline Lucas. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The failure of the G7 to reach an agreement on ending investment in all fossil fuels speaks volumes about the Prime Minister's true climate leadership. Today he mentions coal, but again ignores oil and gas. That's not a green industrial revolution, that is business as usual. Now, the International Energy Agency said last month that there must be no new oil, gas or coal development if the world is to reach net zero. So with the success of COP26 now hanging in the balance, will he heed the call from 101, 101 Nobel laureates for a global fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty? And will he pursue that with G7 leaders and others before the climate summit? Or is he happy for that to be judged a colossal failure of his leadership too? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, the summit agreed, uh, uh, which I thought was ground. But when you consider how much uh, some of these countries are dependent on coal, I think it was groundbreaking to agree uh, not to support any more overseas coal and uh, the commitments on net zero and on making progress by 2030 are outstanding and it can be done. Uh, her, her mood of gloom and pessimism is not shared by the people of this country. We know uh, that in 2012, 40% of our power came from coal. It's now, thanks to this Conservative government, the actions we've taken uh, to reduce dependence on coal, it's now down to less than, less than 2% uh, and falling the whole time. The whole world knows that and they're following the UK's example. Let's go to Derek Thomas. Derek. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's absolutely right that I congratulate the Prime Minister and all those involved in hosting the G7 summit in my constituency over the weekend. 
uh, absolutely fantastic event, and we in Cornwall feel very proud that we of the part we played. Also to thank the police, who were quite incredible and travelled from all over the country to help out. But also an apology for the Prime Minister, because the truth is that we're very proud of the Carvis Bay Declaration, and I may well mention it once or twice in the years to come. We're proud of the Carlos Bay Declaration because of the commitments to COVID vaccines. We've heard the education of 40 million extra girls, global climate change response, and also a fairer economic recovery and job creation. Will my friend, the Prime Minister, commit to further opportunities for Parliament to understand the details of the Carlos Bay Declaration as they become available? Prime Minister. Yes, Mr. Speaker. The Carbis Bay, and I thank my honourable friend, the Carbis Bay Declaration is the foundation of the uh, treaty that this country has been helping to prepare and which we've been pioneering uh, for, against any future pandemic. And uh, the, the, the crucial elements are, are the zoonotic uh, research hubs, the, 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 the pathogen surveillance network, uh, the undertakings to uh, share data, to prevent uh, barriers between our countries in uh, the export of, uh, of PPE, medicines, uh, vaccines, uh, and other things. It is the foundation uh, ensuring that a, uh, the, the time between a new variant arriving and a new vaccine should be kept down to 100 days, uh, making sure that we, we spread uh, know-how and uh, manufacturing capacity around the world. This is the foundation of a new global approach to tackling pandemics. The UK has been absolutely instrumental in setting uh, this up, uh, to say nothing of the funding uh, that we have put in, and uh, I believe that uh, the Carbis Bay Declaration will be seen as uh, a very, very important step uh, towards the treaty later this year. Let's go to Neil Hamby. Neil. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker, uh, and I thank the Prime Minister for his update on the G7 summit. However, I find myself in the absolutely curious position of agreeing with one of my Krakorian Cowden Beath predecessors who commented uh, on the commitment secured with the Prime Minister in the chair as an unforgivable moral failure. The agreement is simply not good enough. 11 billion vaccines are needed and 1 billion have been promised. $50 billion of funding is needed, but only 5 billion has been promised. The World Health Organization have said that COVID-19 is moving faster than the vaccines and the G7 commitment is simply not enough. For the aspiration of global Britain, it is fast becoming a global embarrassment and more indicative of a Dell boy Britain. Will the Prime Minister now show real leadership and redouble such efforts to secure the suspension of intellectual property protections, secure further international efforts to prevent new variants developing, and I would appeal to his self-interest that none of us are safe until everyone is safe. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, he, I'm afraid he's, he's, he is running down uh, the UK's efforts. He's also running down what the summit achieved. Uh, a, a billion more vaccines on top of the uh, the billion that the, the G7 countries have already committed to distributing around the world. At a time, it's only six months after these vaccines were invented, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, it is a quite astonishing thing. And he attacks uh, the performance of, of Britain. Uh, and the UK uh, and, and the UK and the people of the UK. He's, uh, let, me, let me just remind him that we in this country are responsible for one third of the 1.5 billion vaccines that are being distributed around the world. When he, is he going to get that into his head? It is a fantastic record. Uh, on top of the 1.6 billion that we've been contrib contributing uh, to that COVAX, uh, that COVAX rollout. Uh, Mr Speaker, I think the people of this country should be immensely proud of the, the Carbis Bay Declaration, of the vaccines contribution that we're making. Uh, we are working as fast and as hard as we can while we are still getting vaccines into the arms of our own people in this country. And that is absolutely right. Bob Butler. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The communiques from both the G7 and NATO summits speak of the increasing challenges and threats from China, be they military build-up or cyber attacks, human rights abuses or the Belt and Road Initiative. So can my right honourable friend reassure the House that the common values and commitment that we and our partners have to democracy and the rules-based international order will result in both the G7 and NATO tackling the malign actions of the Chinese Communist Party, whatever form they take? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker. I think nobody at either the G7 or at, uh, uh, at uh, NATO uh, wants to get into a new Cold War. 
uh, with China. But on the other hand, uh, they see uh, that the opportunities that we have to trade more with China, to engage with China, must be matched with firmness in our collective dealings with China, particularly when it comes to the Uyghurs, of, as, as colleagues have mentioned uh, several times, uh, when it comes to navigation in the South China Sea and to the freedoms and rights of the people of Hong Kong. Let's go to Stephen Ferry. Stephen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The uh, North Carolina Protocol was a key theme on the margins of the G7 summit. The Biden administration has made clear that it wants to see the Good Friday Agreement upheld I made the point that while there is no immediate prospect of a US free trade agreement, a UK-EU veterinary agreement would not compromise that trade deal in any event. The Prime Minister has already said that he wants to get rid of the checks across the RSC. So why is he so stubbornly resisting that ready-made solution, even on a temporary basis, to reduce those checks across the RSC and to ease tensions in Northern Ireland and indeed to help all UK food exporters? Prime Minister. Well, I, I hope it won't have escaped the Honourable Gentleman's attention that we've just signed a free trade agreement with Australia, uh, Mr Speaker, and we intend to do many more. Let's go to Tom Tugendhat. Tom. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister knows that uh, treaties can occasionally be negotiated, not quite make it through the House of Commons, in the interests of making sure we deliver what we need to in COP26 building on the impressive work of not just the G7 and NATO statements, but also trade deals like that with Australia. Will he commit to making sure that this House is informed well in advance of COP agreements so that we can assist, advise and perhaps even make sure that those agreements pass easily and smoothly to this House and encourage others to do the same? Prime Minister. I will do my best to oblige uh, the Honourable Gentleman, though uh, my experience of, of this matter over the last few years is that this House uh, is uh, a great legislator, but not an ideal negotiator. Let's go to Hilary Ben. Hilary. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The G7 announcement of a billion additional vaccine doses for developing countries was, of course, welcome. But the Prime Minister knows that the head of the World Health Organization says that we need 11 billion doses in total if we're going to vaccinate 70% of the world's population. Where does the right honourable gentleman think the rest of these doses are going to come from so that everyone can be safe because everyone is vaccinated? Mr. Mr Speaker, one of the most important things that we agreed at the G7 was not just uh, the, the Carbis Bay principles that I've, uh, I've outlined uh, that uh, will form part of the the health treaty, uh, but also that we should work together uh, to increase uh, vaccine manufacturing capacity, fill and finish uh, facilities uh, around the world, particularly in, in sub-Saharan Africa. I, I have to tell him uh, that you know, it, it, it is only a few months since these vaccines were invented. Uh, we're going as fast as we can, uh, but uh, our ambition is to vaccinate the world by the end of next year. Debbie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. The G7 meeting was exactly the face modern Britain should present to the world, competent yeah. and confident. Yeah. In terms of the substance, the UK commitment to share 100 million uh, vaccines with less developed countries is, of course, an extremely welcome first step. Can my right honourable friend guarantee that the 70 million doses that will be delivered uh, through 2022 will be in addition to our existing aid budget? Yes. Prime Minister. Yes, I can, I can, Mr Speaker. Chris Brown. I kept on thinking all weekend, thank God Biden beat Trump. Yes. <laughs> Certainly made, I think the Prime Minister's nodding. Um, <laughs> can I just ask, following the Carbis Bay Declaration, can I urge the Prime Minister to come to Wales to sign a Cardiff Bay Declaration? <laughs> this would include radical extra investment in Wales to do the levelling up that the Prime Minister, I think, intends so that every person, whether they live in the valleys of South Wales or they live in um, the posher parts of Cardiff or Swansea or wherever, has an equal chance of getting to work, an equal chance of putting food on the table for their kids, an equal chance of getting on in life, and frankly, an equal chance of having an NHS which is really able to protect them, because the problems that we have in Wales are exactly the same as in England. We need significant extra investment, and the only way we can achieve that is by real hard cooperation between the government in Westminster and the government in Wales. 
Yes, of course, Mr. Speaker. We've massively increased support for the uh, for the NHS, for instance, for uh, all of which is is, is passported through to uh, to Wales. Uh, funding has massively increased. I think it will be, uh, and of course, we work very closely with the government in uh, in Cardiff, the administration in Cardiff. I think it would be helpful in delivering great infrastructure uh, for Wales, whether uh, improving the A55 or uh, or the M4, uh, if. Uh, there was some consistency of, of approach, and uh, the, the M4 bypass, for instance, uh, at the Bring Glass Tunnels, I, I think it was crazy to spend £144 million pounds, uh, of taxpayers' money, £144 million, on a study uh, without actually doing the bypass itself. Very happy to work with the Welsh Labour Government if they get their act together. Let's go to Sir John Redwood. Sir John. Uh, no less than five representatives of the European Union at the G7 tried to hijack the agenda to undermine the people of Northern Ireland with their one-sided and unfair view of the protocol. Will the Prime Minister, who chaired it well, make sure goods can flow freely in the UK internal market, given there are legal ways of doing this unilaterally? Doesn't the Good Friday Agreement require the EU and the UK to respect the needs and wishes of both communities? Mister. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker. I, of course, uh, I thank my right honourable friend, and he's completely right. And it was the the UK who really shocked people in. Uh, it was the EU, I should say, who shocked people in uh, in Northern Ireland by invoking Article 16 of the Protocol in in January and uh, trying to put a a barrier for the movement of vaccines between the EU and and, and the UK. Uh, we never would have dreamed of doing uh, something like that. But that it was it was that action that undermined uh, people's faith in the Protocol. Let's go to Joanna Cherry. Joanna. Mr Speaker, the recent violence and the loss of innocent life in Gaza and Israel underlines the importance of restarting the Middle East peace process. Britain has historic and continuing responsibilities in this region. So can the Prime Minister tell us what steps he took at the weekend to raise and progress the restarting of this important peace process in the Middle East? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, we remain committed, and I, as I, I raise continuously uh, with uh, friends and partners around the world, uh, we remain committed, as do, do our friends in the, in the EU and in Washington, uh, to a two-state solution uh, for the Middle East. Let's go to Alex Shelbrook. Alex. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I first of all congratulate my right honourable friend on the successful hosting of the G7 after the trauma the world has just been through? And at the NATO summit, the discussion of NATO 2030, you will recognise, is one of the most important assessments and forward thinking that NATO has undertaken in many a decade. Reinforced unity, a broader approach to security, safeguarding a rules based international order. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that our position in cyber and space defence not only makes us still one of the biggest contributors to NATO, but also makes us one of the integral partners of the alliance. Minister. Uh, yes, and uh, I thank my honour, because the, uh, the NATO's Project 2030 uh, that Jens Stoltenberg set out at the summit uh, is actually completely uh, in accordance and uh, almost an echo of the integrated review uh, that the government set out uh, with its emphasis on cyber and on, on space defences. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I've sat listening to the Right Honourable um, Gentleman's statement this afternoon, and one of the things I'm proud of is visiting our schools, my schools in Vauxhall, and speaking to young people. And Right Honourable Friend said yesterday, last week, girls' education is the best way we can lift countries out of poverty and lead the global recovery. I heard the right and wrong member's response to the member for Sutton Coldfield around the fact that the G7 leaders did not mention the global aid cut. If that's the case, does my right and wrong friend agree that his actions shows a gaping hole between his words and actions? And will he respect this House by bringing that vote to Parliament and bring that decision here? Prime Minister. Actually, what I, again, what, what I did hear uh, from the leaders around the world was massive, overwhelming support for the objective that she supports of girls' education, and they committed to the G7 committed to, to I think, two point seven five billion dollars uh, to, uh, towards the global partnership for, for education, with the UK uh, increasing our commitment uh, by fifteen percent in spite of the pandemic. And I, I hope that that's the message that she will give to uh, pupils in, in Vauxhall, that we are absolutely committed to this end. 
Harriet Baldwin. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and can I congratulate the Prime Minister and his whole team on delivering such a wonderful G7 summit. And can I welcome the announcement in terms of the replenishment of the Global Partnership for Education. And can I ask the Prime Minister that as our economy recovers and as we return to the promised 0.7 per cent, will he put at the forefront of his work in his time in government to make sure that we really uh, boost uh, the efforts to educate every child in the world through UNICEF, through Education Cannot Wait, through the Global Partnership for Education and of course through our wonderful UK uh, Girls Education Challenge. Yeah. Prime Minister. I thank my honourable friend for, for my honourable friend for her support for female education. I remember discussing it with her many, many times. I know how much she cares about it too. Uh, the, the programme we're embarked on will mean 40 million more girls in school by 2025. 20 million more girls reading over the next five years, and uh, we're going to be doing even more than I was uh, saying to the Honourable Lady opposite when uh, President Kenyatta uh, of Kenya comes here in uh, July for the uh, Global Partnership on Education. Dr. Rupa Hart. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I congratulate the Prime Minister on his recent wedding and the delightful G7 family photos. Can you tell us now what his current thinking is on granting amnesty to illegal immigrants and whether he got a chance to discuss it with President Biden because they did it first there in 1986 and he told me here in day two of the job that he was minded to go down the regularisation route but he was thwarted by predecessors. Was that just a sort of unscripted blurt out flashback to the 2012 pre-PM version of him, pre-Red Wall? Or is he a man of his words? Prime Minister. Uh, we remain committed to a, a generous and open approach to uh, immigration, and uh, this country already does regularise the position of those who have been here uh, for a long time and who haven't uh, fallen foul of the law. What we won't do is go back to a complete free-for-all free and abandon our, the control of our borders to Brussels, which uh, the Right Honourable General Opposite voted for 43 times in the last five years, and which I dare say uh, she did too. And we now go by video link. Stephen Metcalf. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, can I welcome the new climate commitments made by G7 countries to almost halve their carbon emissions by 2030, which will pave the way towards a green global recovery? Does the Prime Minister agree that it is essential we build on the historic climate change commitments made at the G7 with even stronger global commitments at the upcoming COP26 conference? Minister. My honourable friend is completely right, and uh, I think that th this was a, uh, a good uh, waymark, a good, uh, uh, a good. Uh, we made some good steps forward on the on the road to COP26. Uh, there's still uh, a long way to go, but there's a great deal of enthusiasm from other countries because they can see that it creates jobs, and high wage, high skill jobs, as well as solving climate change. Chiawara. Thank you, yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker. And the G7 did agree action on tax dodging corporations, but watered down after the Prime Minister refused to back President Biden's original proposal for a 21% minimum global corporation tax rate, which would have delivered £15 billion a year to Britain, enough to fund a proper COVID catch-up in education and support for COVID-excluded businesses now facing, facing extended yeah, exactly. restrictions. So why did the Prime Minister put global corporation shareholders above British children and British businesses? Wow. Prime Minister. Uh, well, that's, a, that's a great one from the Labour Party, Mr Speaker. But they actually, they actually opposed the increase in corporation tax at the, at the budget. Uh, try, try to remember what you've, you've been doing, what they've been doing over the last few months, uh, Mr Speaker. I think it was a, I think it was a, it was a, a, a great achievement uh, after a long time to get the, 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 the Western world, the G7, uh, to agree to find a way to, of, of taxing the multinational uh, giants who make profits in, uh, in one country and then book them uh, somewhere else. That was a fantastic thing. And we now have uh, a minimum uh, global corporation tax of 15%. Another great step, I forgot to mention it in my, in my opening remarks, another great step forward at the G7 summit. Well, we now go by video link to John Barron. 
Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And as we reflect on the many successes of the G7 summit, the Prime Minister will know the growing importance of soft power is very much recognised by the G7. Yet there remains a, 50, uh, a 10 million pound shortfall between the government's generous package to see the British Council through the pandemic and what it needs to maintain its international network of offices as defined by country directors in post abroad. If not bridged, the result will be the largest single set of closures in the British Council's proud 90 year history. Given the Prime Minister has told me personally that he gets it, that the 10 million pounds can be given as a loan and our competitors' cultural institutes are actually expanding their physical footprint, will he now ensure that government departments also get it in time for the ministerial statement due shortly? Prime Minister. Uh, I'm, I'm really grateful to my right honourable friend because I, know, and I, I thank him for his continuing campaigning on this, uh, on this issue. Uh, we are giving the, uh, the, the British Council uh, more support now because I know it's been very tough for them during the, uh, the pandemic and on the, the gap of, of 10 million uh, that he uh, identifies uh, the crucial part that he thinks that that, uh, that will play. I will see uh, what further I can do. We now go by video link to Tony Lloyd. And thank you, Madam Deputy, Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister will know that the 100 billion every year of monies for the, the developing countries for climate change transformation is the same 100 billion announced 12 years ago in 2009. He'll also know that the 11.6 billion he, he has announced today is over five years, and he announced it actually two years ago at the United Nations General Assembly. This is not new money, but nor is the UK's contribution of 11.6 billion over five years enough to be our part of the 100 billion every year that was promised by the G7. So if there is going to be credibility in the developing world to play their part at, uh, at COP later on this year, um, will he now put some flesh, give us some details, and make sure that the rest of the G7 give those same details about real spending, not recycling? Prime Minister. Well, he, he should thank you. Uh, he should study what uh, all the G7 countries said, because several of them made very uh, big commitments indeed. Uh, the, the, uh, the Canadians, the, uh, the EU, uh, to uh, climate, uh, to, to financing the tackling of, of climate change. And uh, again, you know, he says that 11.6 billion uh, pounds isn't enough. I, I think that the people of this country will, will think that uh, at a very, in a very uh, tough time, uh, with huge pressure on our resources, uh, to spend £11.6 billion pounds over, over the next few years uh, to help other countries tackle uh, climate change is a huge commitment. And actually, uh, he uh, deprecates. I remember I, uh, uh, how, how people reacted in uh, the UN uh, when I announced it. They were ecstatic, Mr Speaker, and they're quite right. We still have 30 people who would like to ask questions to the Prime Minister and um, around 20 minutes in which to do it. That's probably not possible. But the idea of a statement is that people ask questions. It's not a time for making a speech. And if people ask short questions, then it'll be possible for the Prime Minister to give short answers. And then all will be well because we have a lot of business to get through this afternoon. Anthony Mangnell. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I congratulate the Prime Minister on a successful weekend in Cornwall and for a very successful summit? But away from the doom and gloom of the opposition, it is staggering that Global Britain was on display this weekend in striking new trade deals. Could he perhaps reassure the House that when we look at trade deals, they are the floor, not the ceiling, about the economic growth that this country will be able to strike now and in the future as we reach for CPTPP. Mr. Uh, he's completely right, particularly about the CPTPP. Yeah. Brilliant. Richard Bergen. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. With coronavirus, none of us are safe until everyone is safe. The world needs over 11 billion vaccine doses to end the pandemic, but the G7 vaccine offer falls well short and leaves billions of people without protection. To ramp up vaccine production, we need a temporary waiver on the intellectual property so all countries can access the technology. President Biden supports this. Over 100 other countries support this. But this 
Prime Minister is one of the people blocking it. So isn't the Prime Minister putting the interests of profit-hungry pharmaceutical companies ahead of the lives of millions of people? Prime Minister. I, I, think, I think for the Honourable Gentleman to talk about profit-hungry pharmaceutical companies in view of the uh, efforts made by AstraZeneca to distribute 500 million uh, vaccines around the world at cost are utterly disgraceful and he should withdraw them. Laura Trott. Madam Deputy Speaker, I hugely welcome the Prime Minister's focus on gender equality at the G7, and I note that the Leader of the Opposition didn't mention girls or women once in his opening statement. Um, can the Prime Minister, uh, who set some very ambitious targets on girls' education and ending violence against um, women and girls, come back to the House before 2026 to reassure us that progress <coughs> is being made on these very important topics? Yes. Prime Minister. Uh, of course, Mr Speaker, the, the, the project will be scarcely off my lips. Peter Grant. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm not sure if you're more surprised at the Prime Minister persistently giving a promotion or a sex change, but we'll, we'll leave you to decide that for yourself. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, while there are still billions of people across the world unvaccinated, all of us who've been vaccinated remain at risk that a new vaccine resistance train could evolve and undo all of the work that has been done here and in other uh, wealthy countries. So will the Prime Minister give a simple commitment to the principle that no one can claim to have defeated the coronavirus until the whole of humanity is adequately protected? Uh, of course, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. <laughs> Tobias Elwood. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Could I congratulate the Prime Minister on what was achieved in the G7 uh, summit in Cornwall? The West had become a little risk averse of late, and if the summit, summit achieved anything, it was a recognition that the world is on a worrying trajectory with new threats, new technology new power bases posing complex long-term challenges to our security, our trade, our freedoms and indeed our standards. The rise of China economically, technologically and militarily means this will be their century. And the need for a new Atlantic Charter underlines how frail our global order has become. Would the Prime Minister agree the actions that we, the West, choose to take over the next few years in addressing the long international to-do list will determine how the next few decades play out. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, I thank my right honourable friend. These, this, this, these are crucial times, and it was great to see uh, the summit accomplishing so much uh, and so fast. Darren Jones. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Might I just start by noting that the Prime Minister seemed a little irritable this afternoon, and I know that it's difficult when friendships break down, but I have every faith he'll find reconciliation in due course. Now, the IMF concluded uh, that the IMF concluded that there would be a $9 trillion economic boost if the world's COVID vaccines are provided. We've heard multiple times that whilst the $860 million G7 is welcome, it's not enough. Could the Prime Minister explain to the House why we couldn't go further at the G7? What were the blockages to getting above $860 million vaccines? Prime Minister. Uh, we've gone about the 860 uh, million vaccines, Madam Deputy Speaker. We're, we're, we're on top of that, 1 billion the G7 is already doing. Uh, we pledge a further 1 billion vaccines. Jeremy Hunt. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Did the Prime Minister talk to Chancellor Merkel and Prime Minister Suga about the tremendous success of social care reforms in Japan and Germany? Did he talk to Prime Minister Trudeau about the brilliant innovation in care home villages in Canada? Did he talk to President Biden about the amazing things that older people are doing, including the most powerful job in the world? And did he return to Downing Street refreshed and resolute and say to his neighbour, it is time, no more international conferences until we fix the crisis at home. It's time to back Boris and get social care done. <laughs> Prime Minister. I, I, I actually, I thank my honourable I thank you for his continued uh, support. But um, I did actually talk to uh, Angela Merkel about social care, and uh, I'll tell him what she said at another time. <laughs> Stephen Timms. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. There was widespread disappointment that the G7 didn't commit to additional climate finance beyond what had already been agreed. What steps will the Prime Minister take between now and, and COP26? to ensure that summit does deal effectively with the challenge of loss and damage in the countries most at risk. Uh, we, Prime we will continue with our efforts. We're, we're 80 per cent of the way there, uh, and we will we'll, uh, blow away the clouds of uh, despondency that seem to hang over some uh, members here today. I think it was a highly successful summit, and we're going to get there. Mark Harper. I'm grateful, Madam Deputy Speaker. In the Prime Minister's statement, he refers to the G7 combining our strength to defeat COVID. 
But wouldn't it be more accurate to say that we need to make sure we can vaccinate the world to protect people, but then we need to learn to live with what will be an endemic virus? And does he share my concern that, about the things that are going on in government at the moment, uh, and the warnings about the restrictions coming back in the autumn and the winter as cases rise, and can he rule out that taking place? That would reassure many colleagues on both sides of the House. Prime I, I, I thank my right hon. I, I did see something about this uh, this morning, about some paper or other, that I, I means absolutely nothing to me. Our objective is to, to go forward with the, uh, the roadmap and, uh, and, and bring back the freedoms we love. Liam Byrne. Uh, thank you. The original Atlantic Charter made a commitment to banish the world from fear and want, curiously missing from the redraft. But the Prime Minister's ambition to vaccinate the world by the end of 22 is the right one. The IMF's assessment of the deal done, however, on Monday, is that two-thirds of the grant financing needed to vaccinate the world is still missing. That's $23 billion. So the question for the Prime Minister is, where is that money going to come from and when? Prime Minister. I think that the G7 and uh, uh, the West are making huge. These vaccines were only invented six months ago, uh, or, or a little bit longer. Uh, we're making incredible progress in distributing them now, and uh, the ambition that we reconfirmed in Carbis Bay uh, was to vaccinate the world by the end of next year. And that's that's a pretty that's a pretty rapid pace. Andy Carter. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I uh, welcome the plans set out by the G7 leaders to invest in global testing and slash the time needed to develop new vaccines? The Prime Minister mentioned just a moment ago it's a little over six months since scientists uh, in Cheshire at the Life Science Industries and AstraZeneca developed these new vaccines. And I'm sure you'll want to join with me in congratulating them, not just for the work that they've done here in the UK, but around the world. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that strengthening global cooperation on health and investing in new technologies is the only way to ensure that we never get a repeat of this health crisis? Prime Minister. I, I, of course I congratulate AstraZeneca in, uh, in Cheshire uh, and, uh, and everywhere else where they are established in the UK and, uh, and around the world. They've done uh, an outstanding job and, uh, but he, and he is absolutely right to stress the importance of international cooperation and we must never, ever again uh, see countries uh, blockading uh, vaccines and the movement of vaccines from one uh, part of the world to another. Jonathan Edward. Dear uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, at the, uh, an EU-UK uh, food and plant safety agreement would not only alleviate uh, Northern Ireland friction, but also remove non-tariff barriers for Welsh exporters created by the current Brexit deal. As the Honourable Member for North Down said, the US President guaranteed at the G7 that such alignment wouldn't jeopardise a UK-US trade deal. The Prime Minister could actually have a slice of cake and eat it if he sees sense. Can you clarify whether reports of reduced checks within the trade deal with Australia, as he used in his reply to the member for North Down, would prevent such alignment with the EU? Uh, Prime Minister. Plainly, can, uh, free trade deals with uh, the CPTPP, with Australia, uh, with countries around the world that we uh, are doing and will continue to do, uh, make a nonsense of the proposal uh, that he outlines. Marco Long. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. So, our hosting of the G7 and the reaffirmation of our indestructible partnership with our cousins across the pond, also seen through NATO, sets the scene for a brighter and far more aspirational future for the whole of the UK. Does the Prime Minister agree with me? And can he explain, perhaps in writing if he doesn't have time now, what this means for the people of Dudley North and the rest of the country? Prime Minister. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, the people of Dudley North and the, and the rest of the country will, I think, benefit uh, massively from a a uh, new age of uh, cooperation uh, between our democracies, between, for the, from the security uh, that we're establishing, but also from our, our global commitment to work together to build back greener uh, so that we generate hundreds of thousands, millions uh, of high-wage, high-skill jobs in Dudley, uh, in the West Midlands and around the whole of the UK. Yeah. We now go by video link to Patrick Grady. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. He said that no countries have raised concerns about the aid cuts. Well, I can give him a list as long as my arm of organisations and projects that are going to be devastated by these cuts. Does he not understand that as the only G7 country cutting aid, the UK is undermining any claim to be a soft power superpower, and more importantly, putting thousands and thousands of lives at risk? Uh, absolutely not. And we go by video link. To Sir David Evanett. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker.
Can I congratulate my right honourable friend on a very successful G7 and on his leadership of the meeting? So much was agreed. Could he confirm that Global Britain will continue to champion and promote the provision of girls' education right across the world? My Minister. I thank my right honourable friend, and I know how much uh, he cares about us. I remember uh, campaigning with, uh, with him on this myself. Uh, we've uh, supported at least 15.6 million children in the last uh, five years or so to get an education. 8.1 million of them uh, were girls. We're going to be spending, as I said, more than £400 million uh, getting girls an education uh, over the next five years. Rachel Mask. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Every day we're hearing of more and more horrific experiences of violence against women and the wider Uyghur Muslim community, including the disappearance of children in the Xinjiang region of China. The scale of these atrocities has not been met by the Prime Minister's report of the G7. And therefore, what discussions did he have about extending economic and trade sanction, about using his powers under the uh, Magnitsky um, measures and also calling for a special meeting at the UN to find a mechanism in order to hold these crimes to account. Prime Minister. Uh, we, did, um, uh, we did discuss it many times uh, over the last uh, uh, few days. Uh, the, the, what, what's happening in Xinjiang, the, the suffering of the Uyghurs and particularly uh, the, the crimes against women that, uh, that she describes. The difficulty with the UN uh, approach, uh, the UN Security Council approach, as, as she will understand, is that China is a member. Steve Double. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Cornwall was proud to host the G7, and will the Prime Minister join me in thanking all those who worked so hard to make it a success, our police who came from all over the country, Cornwall Council and public health officials, many businesses and volunteers, and the people of Cornwall who, with good humour, welcomed the world despite the inevitable disruption. I know he's as keen as I am that the G7 leaves a lasting legacy in Cornwall, and I was pleased to show him our ambitions for spaceport Cornwall. So would he join me in working and putting the full weight of government behind uh, enabling us to achieve this ambition of launching satellites from UK this time next year? Uh, I, I thank my honourable friend, and he's a, been a fantastic campaigner for uh, the Cornish uh, spaceport. I, I was amazed to see what they've already done, the way it's inspiring uh, young people in Cornwall, and I look forward to working with him on getting a launch uh, before too long. Christian Matheson. Um, Deputy Speaker, when we left the EU, we were told that the economic hit would be made up by free trade um, agreements with the EU and with the United States. But as the sausage dispute uh, and the rebuke from President Biden shows, we're miles away from these agreements um, at the moment anyway. So uh, will the Prime Minister understand that uh, whichever way he goes on the dispute in Northern Ireland will inflame those tensions with those two party bodies um, again? Uh, isn't this really quite some dispute to alienate our two closest trading pi 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 partners? Prime Minister. We have a free trade deal with the EU. It's a fantastic deal, and our trade with the, uh, with the US is growing the whole time. James Sunderland. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister would have enjoyed formal and less formal dialogue with EU leaders at the G7. Can I please ask him whether any empathy was expressed for the trade frictions that we're currently experiencing with the Northern Ireland Protocol at the behest of a third party? And was indeed there any sense that the EU might acquiesce to unilateral action by this country because of the frankly bonkers situation that the UK cannot sell sausages to the UK? Uh, Prime Minister. My, my honourable friend puts the matter very succinctly, but, it, but it's not. Uh, the, there, are, there are many ways in which uh, we're, we're seeing the uh, a disproportionate ap and, and uh, a unnecessary application of the, of the protocol. Uh, I think our partners understand that, and uh, we're going to. Uh, we're hoping for some, some pragmatic solutions before too long. I, we will manage to uh, get everybody who's on the list in. I thank people for being succinct and the Prime Minister for also being brief. It's wonderful. Mr Kevin Jones. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister delivered his statement on the Australian trade deal in his usual sunny, optimistic manner. Uh, but like all his statements, once you look at the detail, it comes with a nasty aftersmell, which will, its source will be of uh, familiarity to many British farmers. Uh, but, so can I ask him in detail 
how this deal is going to affect the livelihoods of farmers in my constituency in North Durham and across County Durham, uh, particularly hill farmers who not only produce good quality British food, but also are the custodians of some of the land, the most beautiful land in this country. Prime Minister. Uh, farmers in County Durham will have the opportunity uh, to export their wonderful produce uh, tariff-free uh, to a market that uh, is growing the whole time, and that, in and that includes uh, the comprehensive uh, trans um, progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. It is a huge opportunity uh, for, for British produce, uh, beef, dairy, uh, the lot, and, uh, and I hope that he will champion it. Flick Drummond. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the commitment of the G7 to open society's statement to promote the human rights of women and girls. As co-chair of the Women, Peace and Security APPG, can I ask my right hon. Friend to keep in mind that this is vital for the future for Afghanistan, where women and children are under threat at present? Mr. Minister. Uh, I, I thank my hon. Friend and may I wish her a happy birthday, I think. <laughs> and and uh, to confirm that we, we uh, see the, uh, the, one of the great achievements of the UK presence in Afghanistan over the last uh, two decades has been to the education of, of girls uh, and young women. Uh, we don't want to see that uh, all jeopardised now. That's why we're working with our friends uh, at the G7 and NATO to make sure that uh, we leave a, a lasting legacy. Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister talks very proudly about our commitment to NATO. That, of course, depends on having a strong military in the United Kingdom. I just wondered whether he regrets his decision to break his election promise and cut the armed forces by 10,000. Uh, Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we're uh, investing uh, another £24 billion in uh, our defence, with the biggest increase in spending uh, since the end of the Cold War, uh, and we're one of the few countries around uh, NATO to contribute more than 2% uh, percent of our GDP to NATO. This is the party that believes in our arms, armed services, and uh, the, the Labour Party uh, opposite. Uh, it was only recently that uh, they, were they, they were campaigning to put into office a man who wanted to abolish the armed forces. Celine Saxby. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. My right honourable friend was right on Monday when he said that the peace and stability brought by NATO has underpinned global prosperity for over 70 years. Can he assure me that levelling up our military as part of the new NATO 2030 agenda will encompass our forces' potential across the whole country, including the excellent Royal Marines at the Chivener Barracks in my North Devon constituency, where I believe his grandfather was stationed for a time, so that NATO will continue to be the bedrock of global defence for future generations? Prime Minister. Uh, yes, I want to thank. I, and my, my grandfather was indeed stationed at Chivener. I, I want to thank the, the Royal Marines uh, at Chivener who did uh, such an outstanding job. Of uh, looking after us all during the uh, the, G, the, the G7, and they are going to transform into the future commando force that will contribute uh, to a more agile and active NATO alliance. Matthew Pennicott. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. At the G7, he and other leaders reasserted their intention to honour the 2009 promise of 100 billion USD in climate finance annually to support developing nations, but sufficient concrete financial commitments to make up the shortfall did not materialise. Does the Prime Minister agree that the commitment must be met by the UN General Assembly in September at the very latest if we're not to risk failure at COP26 in November? Prime Minister. Uh, the, the UN General Assembly is, is indeed, uh, is indeed a very important uh, way station, uh, but this was uh, a great start. Dr. Julian Lewis. Given our shared belief that without the US and NATO there can be no security for the UK and Europe, does my right honourable friend recall the strain on Anglo-American relations caused by Huawei's infiltration of our critical national infrastructure? And will he therefore ensure that companies with dodgy and dubious links to the Chinese and Russian regimes will be firmly and fully shut out from building or operating our vital data and power pipelines in future? Prime Minister. Um, my my honourable friend knows a great deal of what he, about what he speaks, and uh, that's why we passed the uh, the recent legislation uh, to ensure that we uh, protect this country from uh, the loss of intellectual property, uh, the sale of, business, of crucial uh, national security businesses uh, to uh, unreliable partners overseas. 
Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. There has been virtually no rationale or assessment brought forward for the UK government cuts to international aid that have been confirmed so far. And the lack of responsibility taken for the damage that this will do is astounding, especially when the 0.7% commitment was in the Tory manifesto. So how does the Prime Minister think this squares with Global Britain? And how does he justify this shameful, these shameful cuts to his G7 counterparts? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I, I, I repeat that the countries around the world are in awe of this country's continued contributions and they know uh, that we're spending £10 billion uh, at a very, during a very difficult time and they also know, because they have uh, long memories, uh, that we're spending more now than the Labour Party ever did under, under Gordon Brown or Tony Blair. Nikki Aiken. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The G7 set out plans to lift women out of poverty and build back a more equal world by putting 40 million more girls into school in the next five years. Another example of global Britain as a force for good. Does my right honourable friend agree that investing in women and particularly girls' education is one of the most efficient ways to create economic growth in developing countries? And can he confirm? Sorry, confirm that the UK will continue to lead the way on girls' education moving forward. Yes. My, my honourable friend is, is completely right, and I think that investing in, in girls' education, 12 years of quality education for every girl, is probably the single best, most efficient uh, policy uh, that you can support uh, around the world, and that's why we're putting another £430 million into the Global Partnership uh, for Education, uh, with more to come in July. We now go by video link to Navendu Mishra. Madam Deputy Speaker, earlier this month, three civilians were tragically killed in a Turkish drone attack on a refugee camp in northern Iraq. This is all part of a sustained military action from Turkey, Turkish state, against the Kurds that has been ongoing since April. We've also learned this month that Turkey's chief prosecutor has sought to expand the indictment seeking to shut down the country's leading pro-Kurdish political party. This is a disgraceful attack on a minority community. Will the Prime Minister condemn the actions of the Turkish government and call on our NATO partner to stop these attacks on the Kurdish on Kurdish communities? I, I thank the honourable gentleman. Uh, the the situation in uh, in north uh, western uh, Iraq is extremely uh, complex, and uh, the. Uh, I, I think we must, we must accept that the, the, the Kurdish fighters have done an extraordinary job uh, against ISIS and, uh, and against uh, the, the forces of Bashar uh, al-Assad, uh, but uh, there is clearly a, a long-standing uh, uh, difficulty in their relations with uh, the, the Turkish uh, forces, uh, who themselves uh, are bearing the brunt of uh, an, a huge uh, crisis of uh, of refugee flows, uh, but I will study the incident uh, that he uh, that he uh, that he describes. Pauline Latham. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I absolutely applaud the Prime Minister's determination to provide 12 years of quality education for girls, something he's done for many, many years. But with the FCDO budget being slashed, like UNICEF 60%, and family planning, which stops a lot of girls going to school by 80%, how does he think that will be achieved? Uh, well, uh, I'm grateful, Mr Speaker, but we are increasing our funding for, uh, for girls' education, as I say, to uh, £430 million. That's about a 15% increase, and I think an outstanding thing for this country to do uh, in very, very difficult times. And may I, would, by the way, thank, uh, congratulate my honourable friend, because I think that her, her proposal for uh, banning underage weddings, uh, which he brought to me, is now being carried forward. As, uh, you, uh, 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 can, I, can I thank and congratulate her on her work in that matter? Yeah. Jim Shannon. Deputy Speaker, can I thank the Prime Minister for his statement today? Uh, and, and would the Prime Minister outline the steps taken to inform the members of the G7 summit of the constitutional position of Northern Ireland, which seems to have gotten confused, and with particular reference to American President Biden, and French President Macron, and will follow up instructions and information be sent to help them grasp the fact that Northern Ireland was, is in this centenary year, and will continue to be an integral part of the United Kingdom? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Yes, I, I think it's important that everybody understands that, and 
uh, though actually the media accounts of what took place uh, differed very much from what actually happened at, at, the, at the summit, where this wasn't really uh, much of a topic of, uh, of discussion. But I think people uh, do understand that Northern Ireland is an integral part of uh, the United Kingdom for economic and all other purposes. And finally... Mark Pawsey. Thank, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. May I applaud the Prime Minister for the time he spent at the dispatch box uh, this afternoon, in which he's spoken of the importance of increasing vaccine coverage around the world. And I very much welcome the 100 million doses of COVID vaccine that he's committed to countries with less developed health care systems than our own. But supporting the poorest in this way does need finance from both us and our partners. So may I ask him once again to look at our budget for this most valuable of causes? Uh, I, I thank my honourable friend, and he's absolutely right that this should be uh, uh, one of the great focuses of the of UK uh, spending in the next uh, in the next few years overseas uh, spending. I, 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 I repeat what I said uh, earlier on about the uh, the 70 million uh, doses next year that will not come out of the existing ODA uh, commitments, but clearly funding uh, vaccine technology around the world is one of those things in which this country excels, and we're going to be doing a lot more of it, Madam Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I thank the Prime Minister and everyone who took part in uh, this session for uh, doing so with alacrity. Uh, so I will now suspend the House for three minutes in order that arrangements can be made for the next item of business. Order.